Buenas and and half a day and happy new year to everyone. The Committee on Environment, Revenue and Taxation, Labor Procurement, Statistics, Research and Planning is calling this virtual public hearing to order. It is now 9 a.m. Monday, January 3rd, 2022. A notice of this morning's virtual hearing is provided via email to senators, stakeholders and the local media on December 23rd, 2021 for the five day notice and January 1st, 2022 for the 48 hour notice, thus meeting the requirements of, of open government law. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues that have joined me here today, uh, Senator Tony Ada, Senator Chris Duenas, Senator Talataitigui. Thank you, thank you colleagues. The purpose of this virtual public hearing is to receive testimony on the following agenda items. Executive appointment of Mr. Andrew Gale to serve as a member of the Guam Solid Waste Authority Board of Directors, bill number 215-36 COR, sponsored by Senator Teloti Taitigui, co-sponsored by Senators Lee Anthony Ada and Vice Speaker Tina Rosemary Barnes. It's an act to amend section 5127 of sub article C, article two, chapter five, division one, title five, Guam code annotated, relative to commercial leasing of public real property and related facilities. Uh, bill number 224-36 COR, sponsored by myself, Senator Sabina Flores Perez, co-sponsored by Senator Teloti Taitigui and Senator Joanne Brown. It's an act to repeal chapter 19, division three of title 30 Guam administrative rules and regulations, and to add a new chapter two to title 12 Guam administrative rule and rules and regulations relative to clarifying insurance continuing education. The committee will continue to receive written testimony until 4 p.m. Friday, January 7th, 2022. Please address testimony to Senator Sabina Flores Perez, Chairperson of the Committee on Environment, Revenue and Taxation, Labor Procurement, Statistics, Research and Planning, and can be dropped to the mailboxes at the Guam Congress Building or emailed to office at senatorperez.org. The rules of conduct for this virtual hearing are as follows. Uh, the host of the hearing will mute all participants until called upon by the chair. Virtual background should not be utilized during this hearing. A participant's face must be visible at all times. When called to speak, please ensure that you're unmuted and you're speaking into your microphone. Individuals testifying shall first be recognized by the chair before speaking and shall state their name for record keeping purposes. The order of questioning will begin with the chair followed by my colleagues. Each Senator will be allowed to pose questions to an individual agency testifying. Questions and testimony shall be confined to the substance or nature of the agenda personal inference as to character and motive of any senator or any individual testifying is not permitted. Uh, I'd like to now uh, acknowledge my colleagues who have joined me, uh, Senator Jim Moylan and Senator Joanne Brown. Thank you for joining. So now to begin our agenda, uh, to hear testimony on the executive appointment of Mr. Andrew Gill to serve as a member for the Guam Solid Waste Authority Board of Directors. Some of the responsibilities of the Guam Solid Waste Authority Board include the following to establish and modify with approval of the PUC reasonable rates and charges for collections, transportation, disposal, storage, recycling, processing of solid waste, to recover the full cost of providing solid waste management services, uh, to require the preparation of any necessary environmental impact assessment or environmental impact reports and plans for any mitigation measures, uh, to select uh, the general manager and to adopt and maintain a system of accounting. The board may also appoint a secretary, a comptroller and an attorney who shall serve at the pleasure of the board and whose duties and compensation shall be fixed by the board. Notice of, of this public hearing was sent to the Guam Salt Waste Authority Board of Directors. Uh, currently there's no written testimony at this time. And so now um, I don't have anybody signed up to testify so I would like to now invite the, the nominee himself to provide uh, his his testimony. Um, you're you're recognized, uh, Mr. Gale. Good morning. <clears throat> Thank you, Senator Perez. Mananasi uh, and Happy New Year, Senators. Um, I'd like to thank you for joining me this morning or for hearing my testimony this morning regarding my appointment to the Guam Solid Waste Authority Board of Directors. Um, I am currently the Chief Operating Officer of GTA, and I've been with GTA going on about 17 years, uh, started right after privatization. Sorry. Um, I've been on the Guam Solid Waste Authority Board uh, since about 2013. 
uh, and been chairman since maybe about 2015 or 2016. Um, I was first appointed by Governor Calvo, uh, reappointed by Governor Calvo, and I'd like to thank Governor Leon Guerrero uh, for having the confidence in me uh, to reappoint me to another term. Um, when I first started with the Guam Settle Waste Authority Board, um, it was under receivership. Um, and um, there were uh, lots of different issues that the board had to address as we were, one, in receivership, and two, transitioning from a line agency of the uh, Department of Public Works to an autonomous agency that was run by a board and um, with management that had very specific requirements based on the statute. Um, I'm happy to say that, uh, you know, as, as you know, we are almost entirely out of receivership, not quite there yet. There's one last item remaining uh, as, uh, uh, from the, uh, as, as I understand it from the court, and that would be the finalization of the ORDOT post closure plan. Uh, there is a, um, a, a permit that is being um, uh, offered for public testimony, public comment notice for this the permit, the final permit for the ORDOT post-closure plan. Um, and I expect that the court will order a hearing either this month or early next month uh, for a status update from the receiver. And I expect at that time they will transition from receivership into the final post-closure plan, which would have the um, the money that we, uh, the money from Guam Solid Waste Authority for the maintenance of that um, the ORDOT post-closure uh, cap uh, deposited into a trust account and um, handled by a, uh, a trustee uh, with the um, advice and consent of the Guam um, EPA, Guam Environmental Protection Agency. Um, now, one of the things I, I did learn out of, uh, from, this, from this long period of receivership was the most important thing for the Guam Solid Waste Authority is to um, is to make sure that we um, we prioritize the the handling and disposition of municipal solid waste. That is the most important thing for us, and to do it in meeting all the regulatory requirements um, as imposed by local and federal authorities. Um, by not doing that is how um, Gov Guam got into the problem problems with the receivership. And we do not want to go back to that uh, case ever again. Um, as a recent update, um, I would like to update um, you, senators, this morning that we have recently hired a new general manager, um, Mr. Irvin Slyke. Um, he replaced Larry Gast. Larry Gast um, was with us for a few years, and he decided to retire. Uh, and so uh, we 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 went through an exhaustive search and found Mr. Slyke, who meets all of the the um, the current uh, regulatory, uh, legal, and statutory requirements to be the general manager of Guam Solid Waste Authority. Um, he has tremendous amount of experience in both opening and closing landfills, in operating landfill, and in op and in operating a municipal solid waste system. Uh, further, uh, at Ladzon itself, our current landfill, cell three has been completed, and we are now depositing municipal solid waste in that cell. Uh, Mr. Slyke is. Further, looking at a study, uh, probably starting a feasibility study this year uh, regarding the capping of cell one and two. He has some interesting concepts about, about how uh, the Guam Solid Waste Authority should go about um, not only creating new cells, starting new cells, but capping existing cells. So it's more of a, um, uh, more, more of a gradual type thing rather than wait a whole bunch of years, do something, wait a whole bunch of years, do something. So. It's, it's a very interesting uh, concept that he has. And, and I said his experience with opening, closing, and operating landfills, both in the US and in Canada, uh, have, been, um, uh, have been beneficial to us uh, in his short tenures thus far. Um, further, there's another update. As you all know, the, the pandemic has seriously impacted um, Guam Solid Waste Authority revenues, much like other, other government entities on, on the island. Um, but while our expenses, many of our expenses are fixed expenses set by set by contractual rates or or other reasons. And so um, we have had an issue um, with um, dipping into our uh, fund in order to remain 
in order to keep paying our, our expenses and our um, uh, and continue to operate in the municipal solid waste collection system. Uh, the governor has allocated funding in fiscal year 21 and, and fiscal year 22 uh, to help us um, because without that uh, funding, uh, we would have had to, the board would have had uh, no choice but to implement a rate increase to make sure that we met our financial obligations as, as Senator Perez indicated in her, in one of the responsibilities of the Guam Solid Waste Authority Board is to make sure that we, we charge the rates that help support the municipal solid waste system. Um, and so by delaying this, this further rate increase, we have also presented an idea uh, with the governor alongside with uh, Guam EPA and, and their consultants about implementing um, island waste, island, we call it island-wide collection. And this is where we would, um, we would mandate um, uh, solid waste fees and collection from all island residents who are eligible to receive service from the Guam Solid Waste Authority. Currently, Guam Solid Waste Authority has about 20, 21,000 residential subscribers. Uh, our estimates indicate that that should be about 38,000 residential subscribers. And so there is a, so what are those other 18,000 or 17,000 uh, residents doing with their, with their garbage? Well, there's, an, there's, there's a certain amount that might be illegally dumped, but, but not a large percentage. We, we think the largest percentage of, of municipal solid waste from those other 17,000 residents comes from a technique called piggybacking. And what piggybacking means is they take their residential trash and, and put it in someone else's bin. Right? They'll, you might be, have one household that might share two bins. So now we've got the, the municipal requirements uh, for solid waste now, now um, shared, shared among uh, residential households. Or they might take that trash and bring it to a, a commercial dumpster, either at their office or, or somewhere like that. Um, uh, there, there are also a, a fair amount of people that use our, our um, transfer stations. So they do pay a, a smaller fee for our transfer stations. But, but we do think a lot of it has is, is come from piggybacking. And, and the concept that we're, that we're talking about is, is spreading out that cost among the entire community. You know, um, municipal solid waste collection is, is a sanitary issue. And it's a, you know, it's a, you know, it, we need to be able to collect and, and um, properly dispose of that solid waste uh, for a healthy, uh, healthy environment uh, for, for us and all of our residents here on Guam. So that is the concept. Many other, you know, we, when we, during our, um, a, an audit that was conducted by the Guam Solid Waste Authority by third party, um, third party municipal solid waste consultants, we were one of two out of maybe 50 or 60 jurisdictions that they looked at that did not require a mandatory trash collection or, or, or you know, a mandated a, a solid waste um, um, fee from resident, all the residents in a specific municipality. So uh, in that regard, you know, that's not, that's not one way that Guam wants to be unique, I don't think. So, um, so we have uh, um, advocated and proffered a an, uh, uh, concept and I've been working with the governor's office to help implement this. Um, we, we think that by doing this, it can help resolve some of those problems that I talked about earlier, as well as as well as spread the spread the uh, the expense of the municipal solid waste across a larger base, thus keeping the rates at reasonable levels for the entire um, for the entire subscri subscriber base for the entire ratepayer base. Um, the plan that uh, we have uh, come up with, Mr. Slyke and his team have have uh, have refined a, a plan that was originally started by Mr. Gas. Uh, it would include um, adding more, you know, ordering and and, and uh, distributing more trash bins. For customers, and also a, a fleet of trucks that will help us um, do the collections for the um, for all of the new customers that we would have. Uh, based on you know optimistic timelines of of working with the governor's office for a for a um, for uh, trying to establish the, the 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 legislation, the law that would that would allow us to do this. Uh, and if we go along this particular timeline, we think we may be able to start island wide collection as soon as the end of the, as soon as this year, um, if, if things go well. But again, th that remains to be seen. But th that is our intention, and and that is one of the the things as as the chairman of the Guam Solid Waste Authority and as a member of the Guam Solid Waste Authority Board is one of the things that is is uh, I think important for us to pursue. And uh, I will 
be working with the management team to um, to help make that come to uh, fruition. I'll, that uh, that about sums it up for my um, my comments this morning. Uh, again, I appreciate your time, and I'm available now for your questions. This is Masi, uh, Chairman Gell, and I just want to thank you for all your years of service uh, during these very critical times for uh, Guam Solid Waste Authority, uh, from getting into receivership, now coming out of receivership, and uh, you know establishing a sure footing for this um, this agency to continue to uh, to um, serve our people and uh, protect our environment, and also becoming an ambassador for Guam Solid Waste. I think um, you know your your testimony here is not only um, endorses you as a, as a continuing member of the board, but it also uh, gives light to, you know, what visions and, and the next steps for Guam Solid Waste Authority. And um, so thank you, you know, in, in some ways it's become um, an info hearing <laughs> wrapped into a nomination hearing as well. Um, so yeah, you answered a lot of the questions uh, as far as, you know, what, what to look forward uh, to on the board. And, and you know, I. I think to, uh, yeah, I think to that, um, you know, you answered many of the questions that I would have posed um, in your in your packet. Uh, you, had meant, uh, you, you you ticked off that you have no conflict of interest, which is another question. Uh, and then you are fully engaged in the board's uh, activities. And so um, I think um, I, I don't have any other questions other than, um, yeah, continue doing what you're doing. and. Um, I'm looking forward to working uh, with, with the board and Guam Solid Waste Authority. Um, I guess perhaps, um, uh, do you have any, maybe one question I have in regards to uh, the lawsuit. Uh, do you have any updates on uh, the AG's lawsuit um, in the Supreme Court regarding, um, I guess, reimbursement of costs uh, for some uh emissions? And military waste that was uh, dumped in, in Oregon. Right, right. No, I actually I do not. I do not have any updates. Um, uh, we did have an attorney um, from the Attorney General's office who was assigned to us, uh, Mr. Ken Orcutt. Uh, we had an we have an arrangement with the Guam Solid Waste Authority. We would pay for legal services from the Guam from the Guam Attorney General's office, but Mr. Orcutt resigned, and so we don't have a dedicated attorney there anymore. But um, that is a good question. Um, as you, as the senators may know, the um, that um, the Supreme Court ruling really testified that the, the suit can go forward. Guam had sued uh, the, um, the 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 Department of Navy to recover costs associated with closing the uh, the Ordot land, the Ordot dump, and uh, which I think was entirely justified. And I was I remember talking with Elizabeth Barrett Anderson when she originally decided we ought to do this. And and I, I agreed with her. I and mean, I was a member of the board when, when several of us board members asked asked the receiver, "Hey, shouldn't we be thinking about somebody else? Shouldn't we be thinking about that?" And and I very distinctly remember the receiver saying, "Oh, we don't think there's very much chance of winning." And so I, I was very pleased that Elizabeth Barrett Anderson had a different opinion, right? And uh, and uh, hired some attorneys that had this that had a similar opinion to hers that this is a there there is a distinct possibility that you know all parties. Um, you know, based on the, the circle, you know, I don't know all the specific legal requirements, but all parties uh, have to uh, that participated and contributed to the to the dump need to be responsible for the dump and Gov Guam wasn't solely responsible. So, um, so I will, uh, you know, that, that reminds me, Senator, I, I'll, I'll make a note to get a follow up with the Attorney General's office and, uh, and then update you and the other senators um, with that as well as other members of my board. Great, right, thank you. And the other question I have is the post closure. Um, so, are you? Do you feel confident that Guam Solid Waste Authority uh, is able to um, completely, uh, I guess, end the receivership at, in regards to the post closure, um, carrying out the post closure plan? Um, yeah, I, I'm very confident in that um, for for several reasons. Uh, the, one is, it's a very the post closure plan, as as. Uh, you know, proposed by the receiver many years ago and adopted by the court, puts lots of restrictions and lots of um, lots of uh, checks and balances in there. So it's not it doesn't fall solely upon Guam Solid Waste Authority to ensure that that post closure plan will, will be 
will be executed. There would be there. There's a requirement for a trustee. There's a requirement for a third party engineering uh, consultant to review that, as well as Guam EPA and, and Guam Solid Waste Authority to ensure that all of the um, requirements for the uh, to maintain the the cap are in place, as well as the funding requirements. You know, Guam Solid Waste Authority is has been ordered to um, deposit about $2 million a year into the trust account right off, right from our current revenues, $2 million a year to go into an account that will fund the maintenance of that of that ordered post-closure plan for the next 30 years. So, so I'm, I'm very, fairly confident that it will, it will happen uh, properly and according to all the um, regulations. All right, thank you so much, uh, uh, Chairman Gell, for all the responses. I don't have any further questions. And uh, again, thank you so much for your service throughout these, um, is it eight years or longer? Eight years? Yeah, eight there years. wasn't as much gray, I think, before, but uh, <laughs> Senator Perez, I would, do, I would do like to acknowledge you and thank you for, for being a very supportive uh, chairperson, uh, uh, you know, of, of our oversight of our uh, agency, you've been, you have been very supportive and uh, very open to any, anytime I had any questions or issues. Uh, so I do want to thank you for that and, and hope that you continue to help support Guam Solid Waste Authority. Yeah, definitely. And you're very welcome. Um, so I would like to now recognize uh, Senator Frank Blas, Jr., that's, uh, who has joined us here today. And also I'd like to recognize Assistant General Manager, Pedro Leon Guerrero. Uh, he's here for any questions um, from my colleagues. All right, thank you so much. Uh, so now I'd like to recognize uh, Senator Ada, if you have any questions for the nominee. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair and Mr. Gill. Thank you for your continued service on the board. Um, I think it's important that we keep continuity and uh, moving forward and uh, having that uh, experience behind there to keep uh, what we have going. Uh, and just to, just perhaps maybe a couple of questions. Um, you said you were mentioning that cell one and two are ready for, for capping and then now the operation of cell three. How many more cells do we have uh, available for the landfill? So <clears throat> Pedro, you might want to jump in here if, <laughs> if I get this wrong, but I think we have um, the original design the original design as set forth when this land, when the landfill first opened and it started taking um, municipal solid waste in 2011, I think called for about 10 or 11 cells. The idea, the concept was you would build one or two cells at a time. And then, um, so you wouldn't have to build the entire uh, landfill out, build one or two cells at a time and then deposit trash in there and then work on, um, opening up another cell and closing that other cell. That was the original concept, the original design. Um, Mr. Slyke has some, some new ideas, different ideas on how to do it and how to better handle our situation going forward. And I think his concept is, is actually to make it more of a rolling, a rolling type thing. So you don't build large cells and then cap large cells and then kind of lull for a while and then come back and do it do it again so i think as a concept is build smaller cells and cap smaller pieces of the as the landfill as you go on uh, regardless of that i think the um the end result is still a projected lifespan of the entire landfill of about 50 years this was designed for for 50 years and that was based on the size of the property the amount of municipal the projections of municipal solid waste from the from the population of guam Etc. So there was, there was, there was. We think that the the landfill will go through about 2060 or so, 2061 or so would be 50 years. Now cells. Let's, so let's not get you know hung up on the numbers. Cells one and two were called cells one and two, but cell three is almost the same size. It was just a little bit smaller than cells one and two combined. So, so this, the cell sizes aren't all, always the same. But cells one and two was projected to have a 10 year lifespan. And, and that's exactly what it came up with. They they were pretty close on the on the projections. It was about ten years. Again, we just started. We just finished construction of cell three, and uh, you know, or, you know, the you know, late last year, maybe beginning of third quarter, beginning of fourth quarter, or end of third quarter, beginning of fourth quarter last year, and I started depositing trash. So that was just about ten years lifespan. And and it was and the projections are still are for again based on the current way we operate, based on the current amount of current and projected amount of municipal solid waste that is generated by Guam, 
that it will be about another 40 years of lifespan for this particular landfill. I see. And did, uh, is there any talks or conversations among the, the board about uh, perhaps alternatives like waste to energy or things like that, you know, to kind of stretch the lifespan of, of the landfill or, you know, whatever we can do to keep costs down as, as well? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny there, they have, <laughs> so, you know, my entire tenure as a, as a member of the solid waste authority, I mean, this subject comes up periodically all the time and, and there's various opinions about it. Uh, there is nothing formally discussed as, as a member, as board, as a board. Um, we still have, we have a very strong advocate in recycling and in those alternative methods in one of our board members, you all know Peggy Denny. Uh, so she is a tireless advocate for, for that aspect of diverting of di diverting solid waste from the landfill, whether it's recycling, whether it's upcycling. Uh, those, she's a huge advocate for that. Um, you know, Mr. Mr. Slyke um, recently was asked the same question. He says, what are your, what do you think about waste to energy? And he had an interesting comment. He said, and, and, and I, I wanted to find more information about it, but he said, he said really for, for the amount of municipal solid waste of, uh, that we generate, this island of this size, and the cost of these types of plants, it's, it's, it's very difficult to justify it from a, from, a, um, from a purely return on investment scenario. How much trash is generated? How much, uh, how much energy can be produced? in waste energy, what's that, and what at what cost? How much does it cost to build and operate uh, a plant like that? Now I have very I have very little you know personal experience, professional experience in that, but I thought it was very interesting that that he had that opinion because I hadn't I hadn't heard that before. You yeah. know, from a different from different management, I heard all you know there's there's these plants all over the place and they're they're operated throughout the US and you know fully EPA certified. But 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 if you look at them they're much for much larger much larger municipalities dealing with much larger volumes of waste and, and the economies of scale are, are different for those types of projects. So, so yes, I think one of the things that we'd also have to factor in is, okay, well, it costs us a certain amount of money per acre to build landfills. In this last cell three, it costs us about $2 million per acre to build cell three. Um, now we don't think now Mr. Slyke and his team, they don't think the next cell is going to be $2 million per acre primarily because there was a road and some, some basic infrastructure that had to be redone in order to, to accommodate cell three. And that, that won't have to be done for cell, for the next cell. So his estimates, his current estimates are that the next cell will, will cost about 800,000 per acre to build, but that's still, that's, a, that's a lot of, that's a lot of money to, to spend to, basically dig a hole in the ground and line it and put your your, your solid waste in there but uh, so so those are the factors that I think should be fully fully in uh, fully fully um, fact you know fully um, evaluated mm -hmm. as, as we think of these these concepts but you know I'm you know essentially you know senator I'm, I'm um, what I've learned in my in my years of business working in the in the private industry is you know it's really, it's really about, you know, first it's about economics. Does it make sense from a, from an economic perspective? Is there a return on investment for something? Um, because otherwise it, it's just hard to justify it. Uh, unless, unless there's the philanthropic, uh, you know, that's the other thing about recycling. Recycling doesn't always make sense, but then there's the, 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 the there's the public benefit of, of, of recycling that gets factored in and as a, as a, uh, as a benefit not only from a monetary benefit, but from a you know a community benefit that has to be factored in when when making decisions on behalf of a community like like Guam. I see. Uh, thank you for your perspective on that. Yeah, you know, it's just interesting how the conversations of uh, waste or energy keeps coming about, and you know, I just wanted to get your view on it. And now with the ju uh, new general manager in place, I think it would be uh, it would be uh, prudent to have him speak, perhaps maybe, you know, come do some visitations to the legislature and, uh, you know, that way we can get his point of view on it too and see how we can move from there, or, you know, whether it's uh, something that we, we look into or it's something that we just say, uh, put on the back burner and uh, let's see well, where things go from here. Well, well, thank you, Senator, for that. But, you know, one thing that 
over the years, several people have come up to me and, and they ask me, hey, what do you think about this? You know, I, as my my role as chairman of the, or as a member of the Guam Solid Waste Authority Board. And the first thing I remind them is like, well, as far as I know, it's illegal. So unless, unless something changes in the law, mm-hmm. you know, we can't even, you know, it's, it's just a, it's an academic exercise. Yeah, it's, absolutely. Right. But thank you for that. Thank you for your, your time again. Thank you for stepping up to the plate to answer the call of Governor Leon Guerrero. And, uh, you know, I look forward to voting on your confirmation in the upcoming session if uh, we are able to get your packet moved forward. But thank you, sir. Thanks, thank sir. you, Madam Chair. Ms. Mossy, Senator Ada. Um, Senator Duenas, oh. uh, you're recognized if you have any questions or comments at this time. To Ms. Mossy, Madam Chair, and to Chairman uh, uh, Andy Gale, you know, thank you once again for uh, all of your service and what's been recognized this morning in terms of uh, what you've uh, been able to accomplish over your tenure. Uh, I think it's very important um, with this critical service uh, that we provide to our people to have a steady hand. And so you certainly uh, have my support uh, primarily uh, based on uh, your success. Uh, and also, of course, you know, that uh, you bring a lot to the table uh, in terms of uh, your understanding of, of what you've just explained, business models and understanding uh, what's needed going forward. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, and kind of update, uh, get an update on, uh, because this has been going on for years now in terms of the military bases and their uh, waste management closures. I believe Anderson several years ago was slated to uh, complete its closure and Navy was going to close uh, shortly after. Are we currently, um, as part of uh, customer base servicing, uh, you know, the, the Navy as well as um, uh, the, Air, or the Air Force in terms of waste management? Yes, we are. They are. They were. They are a customer. Recently, they um, we charged them. They were on a separate agreement where they would actually pay for collection from some other company, some private industry, or, or they might have done the collections themselves. And then they were. Um, then we were charging them separately for depositing into the landfill a certain amount per per ton. And what they've recently done through their. Um, not, I think it's Naval Facilities that, that handles it. I mean, Pedro might have more details, but what they've recently done is they said they've, they've combined it. They, they've said that they've, they've um, contracted uh, collection and um, deposits of municipal solid waste under a single vendor, which is just like commercial entities would do. Uh, as a commercial entity, you would hire uh, Mr. Rubbish Man or Lago Sanitation or Pacific Waste they would come and collect your garbage and then you pay them and then uh, and you pay them for the collection as well as the, the deposits in the landfill. And then th- those, those commercial haulers are customers of GSWA. And then we would charge them for the deposit of, uh, in the landfill. And so, so they're moving to that model, but, but as I understand it, they are not handling their own, uh, any municipal solid waste and all of that waste is, is coming to um, Guam Solid Waste Authority and we are charging them the tipping fee for that. You know, I think that's very uh, good and very important for the people of Guam to know. Uh, I think it's um, it adds to the stewardship, knowing that, um, you know, lands that are currently being uh, used and operated for the defense of our nation, um, you know, are, are now uh, having to, uh, you know, comply. Not saying that they weren't complying prior, but certainly we have a handle on it, knowing that uh, whatever comes to our municipal, uh, municipal solid waste facility now uh, as it is now a landfill, as opposed to what it was before a dump, um, you know, uh, manages the waste stream. And I think that's so important. The other reason why, uh, Andy, that I, I bring this up is because to dovetail off of my colleague, Senator Addis' comment, is that, uh, and I appreciate your response. First and foremost, you're absolutely right. Uh, the legislature, uh, you know, that ad authorization would be required before anything would even be moved forward. So I completely, uh, you know, understand your, your statement of this being a, an academic exercise. The reason why I brought the military in is prior to my leaving the prior administration, there were several meetings uh, with uh, Department of Defense uh, individuals who have a requirement, uh, notwithstanding the economies of scale, uh, to get to a certain level of, of, of green energy or, or, or environmentally um, you know, responsible uh, you know, uh, operations. And one of the largest uh, items that they had, uh, at least at that time that I was involved with the meetings, was the ability to do waste management uh, under the possibilities of, uh, you know, uh, waste energy, uh, you know, regardless of the economies of scale. 
And, and so that would be subsidized. And that's why I kind of asked the question. Now, you've mentioned now the uh, of, of what's known in the utility business, of course, as avoided cost, as you've mentioned, in terms of cell, uh, you know, production and the and the cost thereof. So uh, once again, I just bring that up for consideration. I know our colleagues, um, you know, regardless of whether it's in this legislature or somewhere down the road, as we know that the buildup is currently underway, that will bring additional uh, personnel and which would, you know, increase the waste stream, um, you know, and, and, and other factors of, of growth in the future. So it's just important that we at least put it on the record now, um, you know, and, and we'll be discussing. The, the last thing I wanted to discuss, Andy, real quick, is, you know, with the implementation, and I fully support it, uh, you, even your time in briefing the Kabul administration, I remember this has been an ongoing discussion in terms of ensuring that uh, we get as many customers or all customers who are available to uh, avail or have the responsibility of being uh, on, you know, the uh, involved in, in the billing cycle and, and receiving the service of waste management. Um, do you think that you that GSWA would be rolling out any type of, of kind of uh, uh, public notices and discussion just so the public's aware? Or do you think the legislature should maybe conduct a couple of roundtables just so that there's that awareness um, going forward in terms of the final plan of implementation that you're working on with the governor in terms of rolling out uh, this um, this proposal for uh, every household that is available that's not either getting commercial services or otherwise uh, to to be on uh, online with uh, waste management. Um, <clears throat> well, well, you know the like I said, I, I've been. In discussions with uh, Governor Leon Guerrero's fiscal and um, policy team and legal team about about the island wide collection um, and what it would take. So first of all, there would there would obviously be, have to be a public hearing <laughs> for any for any legislation that would be proposed that would that would impose this this mandate on on um, on the on the residents of, of Guam. Not unlike you know similar to the way you know you'd have property taxes imposed on. On people who would who would utilize any of the resources of a community, um, but um, so so first of all there there'd be that, and and the, and the, the legislation that I that I've looked at that, that that we've seen and and I apologize it's not for me to share this legislation it, it really this is coming from the governor's office so I, I we're we're receiving we're giving input and, and providing you know help on her but but um, uh, I, I think at a certain point her her team might reach out to the to you as a, as a body and 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 share share the thoughts but. But the, the the it gives us a framework. It gives it gives it allows the Guam Solid Waste Authority a framework to develop the plan, right? It doesn't. She's not her. The legislation I saw is not here's the here's the plan for island wide collection. No, it, it develops. A, it says you can do this, you can do that, and you are allowed to do this. So so it gives us the framework and the and the um, the legal authority to do to do things to implement the plan. So, so, so that, that's the first thing. The second thing, though, which which you, you kind of is interesting how you bring up is, is Mr. Slyke and Pedro Leon Guerrero and, and their team, they've really put together a, an interesting thought, a plan on, on how to implement it. And that's, that's something that I think we're going to have to do a roadshow. I mean, I, I agree with you. I think, I think our first roadshow is going to be with the governor, but I think our second one is going to be with Senator Perez and, and her committee. Uh, and then the third one might be by Larder's. So Say, look, if we do this, this is how we're proposing to do it. This is what we think it will cost. This is the benefits we think we can do. This is how we want to do it. And so Mr. Slack and Pedro and Kathy Kakigi and Alicia Ferran, who's the current makes up the current management team at, at Guam Solid Waste Authority, have spent some time thinking, you know, what would it take from the number of carts? What would it take from personnel? What would it take from customer service? You know, what would it take from public education? You know, uh, you know, uh, what have new fleets of trucks? What type of trucks? You know. How can we how can we become more efficient? Um, you know, uh, and so and there's some great thoughts and and I don't want to steal their thunder, but I think that I think we're going to have to do it. And I, I would expect that uh, we would be doing more of that as as we as we roll this plan out. That, that's excellent to hear. And that that's what I think the people of Guam want to hear that, you know, some that may have anxiety. I know 30 bucks to a lot of people is not a lot of money to some people. It is. Um, and uh, Pedro, I know, will do a great job. Uh, nice to see you there, Pedro. Good morning. And I'll just close out with this. I mean, you talked about, uh, you know, piggybacking, um, you know, that may maybe those are piggybacking, get a, get the mini cart. <laughs> and they, because like you said, building in the efficiencies that they, they, they pay less because they generate less, but it still gets it to your waste stream and it's still at a, at a cost. 
Well, I'll tell you one thing that the governor's team has been very, I don't want to say adamant, very concerned with was some form of lifeline, some form of lifeline um, program within Guam Solid Waste Authority, similar to how there might be subsidies from other utilities for certain for certain levels, for either whether it's certain, it's certain household incomes or usage or anything like that. Very, very concerned, very, they've asked us in different, uh, in different um, people of, on opinions on, on one of the best ways to implement the lifeline. You know, I shared with them how a lifeline is implemented with, um, with the telephone authority, with us, it's a telephone company. There is a federal lifeline program and, I, and I've, I've shared how that's been done. I know Mr. Duenas, who's the chairman of the CCU has shared um, and the public, you know, how we do it in the power and how they do it in the power and the water authority, how the, how the lifeline is kind of set up that way. And so uh, they're very concerned about uh, making, you know, as we roll this out, that there is a, there is a lifeline uh, aspect to the service. Yes, many of us discussed that as well under the development. Well, it sounds great that, um, you know, there's a lot of care uh, being taken and uh, we look forward, I'm sure the chairperson, uh, Senator Paris looks forward to, um, to the evolution of this. And, and once again, uh, uh, Mr. Gale, I, I just want to let you know that uh, you have my full support. Look forward to voting in the affirmative on your nomination. Uh, as I said at the outset, uh, you have been a steady hand and I think you're absolutely uh, what's required uh, to see through the coming years uh, with regard to this. So Sudus Masi for your service to the people of Guam and uh, Madam Chair, that's all I have to share at this time. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, uh, Senator Chris Duenas. Uh, Senator Tello Taitikui, if you have any questions or comments. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, and Mr. Gale, thank you for stepping up to the plate again, willing to serve, especially with your, um, your background. I mean, you're a very busy man, but I greatly appreciate you taking the time and using your expertise for this. Um, I did want to just uh, elaborate a little bit on that, uh, uh, the discussion you had uh, that Senator Duenas asked you uh, with the governor, I know you don't want to avail uh, some of the information <clears throat> provide that they have, but can you give me a time frame as to what you're looking at as far as implementing something like this, this program? Uh, uh, sure, sure. Um, so we've developed a straw plan uh, that um, Mr. Slyke and his team have, have, have taken, taken a look at what, what it would take to implement from a you know, again, from a from a capital uh, expenditure position, how much money it would take, what we what equipment we'd have to order, the personnel, et cetera. Um, if certain things fell into place, and 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 we were able to not only uh, get the legislation uh, approved and passed and go through that process and and receive some money, we think we think we could start an island wide coll collection program maybe by the end of this year. Uh, we wouldn't have wouldn't we wouldn't necessarily have all the trucks that we would need because the, the ordering new trucks is a long it's a long lead time. But we could get the carts. We could if we had the money we could get the the rolling carts and we could distribute those carts and we could use existing equipment to start our our process of island wide waste collection. Um, Pedro and and uh, his team have been working out the routes and they'll probably be announcing this month or next month, some new updated routes to, to become more efficient with the existing equipment and personnel that we have. And we would roll that into the, um, the, the idea of an island-wide waste collection program. So it's possible, and again, depending on you know, certain aspects of falling into place, that um, the best case scenario that we could start by November, December of this year, we wouldn't have the full new trucks yet, but we'd at least have the carts in place, we distribute the carts, We'd work with getting the, the correct billing system in place, the correct customer lists in place, cooperating with sister utility agencies to ensure that we were accurate in, in you know, expanding our existing customer base to those folks that would be um, required to subscribe to our uh, service. Okay, thank you so much for that. Looking forward to it and, and watching it move forward. Um, you know, I remember uh, in the 35th Guam legislature, you know, there was some issue with funding uh, to Guam Solid Waste um, and you were short in some areas and it's starting to look that same way in, in this new uh, 
fiscal year 2022. I think it was like almost a million dollars in a shortfall in the solid waste um, operations under the CCR, I'm um, CRER report. And, um, you know, even at the end of the fiscal year 2021, there was a major shortfall. So how are you able to deal with the shortfall? And the projected revenue right now, we're showing at the end of um, November at about 900, almost a million dollars in shortfall for uh, solid waste. How are you dealing with that? Yeah, so, so I, I alluded to it briefly in my opening remarks. Um, the, um, the governor has allocated a certain amount of federal funding uh, for us to um, un, to help us offset the to help us make up for that those the shortfall and offset the requirement for a rate increase. As a member of the, the Guam Solid Board of the Waste Authority Board of Directors, you know, we were seeing this and we we're saying, look, the, we we can't continue to operate and and um, um, taking money from a fund from unrestricted reserves to help uh, offset our our revenue shortfall. And so we had. Um, you know, I, I had approached the, the governor and her team and said, look, we're going to have to raise rates. We're going to, this, there's no other way around it. Our, our revenue had gone down and, and our revenue wasn't increasing the way we had projected years ago. The revenue had decreased in terms of what happened in, in the pandemic. You know, commercial revenue had decreased very much. And we had, we had a lot of, of a debt service to pay. You know, we're, we're paying $3 million a year in debt service for the, for the building of Cell 3. Which wasn't anticipated in the overall plan, uh, you know, in the overall life of, of of that, you know, it's always anticipated that as you're depositing rev trash in a landfill, you should be withholding a certain amount in reserves to build the next cell and to also cap your existing cell. You don't ever want to get into a position where you're borrowing money for. For those types of expenses, you want to you want to set your rates such that while you're generating revenue, you're setting aside a proper amount of funds for future expenses. And it so, turned out that the the you know the initial estimates of building a landfill at about eight hundred thousand dollars an acre was a little short was way short for the current cell three the cell three was just finished, which was closer to two million dollars an acre. So, so one, we we had to incur the GovGuam had to sponsor you know um, a bond for us to afford to pay for the cell three. So we're paying the debt service on that. We're putting money into the um, post closure reserve uh, to handle ORDA. So just between those two items, that's five million dollars that comes off of the red the top of our revenue uh to to cover those those two things and that and then we still need to have generate enough reserves for future expenses future cells future caps right. uh equipment replacement etc so so what the governor did is she allocated some money to us because we said look in order for us with this current revenue base and our current future expenses and, our, and what we project our future expenses would be uh, we need to increase our rates and we actually had a proposal and it would, it would it, we had a, a one where we, it would be either one large rate increase in a, in a certain amount of time or two smaller rate increases. And, and as we presented this idea to the governor fiscal team, she said, look, I, I really don't want to do that. Uh, let's do this instead. And, and, uh, and so that's how we come up with this current idea. She had allocated some funds that will get us through the next how, couple of just, I'm Sorry to interrupt. How much was that that she um, provided you again? Um, I think all in all, it was about eight hundred thousand dollars in fiscal year twenty twenty two. Maybe about two million dollars allocated for twenty twenty. For excuse me, twenty twenty one was about eight hundred thousand. Twenty twenty two, I believe, is about two million, and I think another two two and a half million for twenty twenty three. Okay, so she has it spreading out uh, in different uh, years. My concern right now, uh, Mr. Gale, is that you know in FY twenty one there was a shortfall of two million to um, about two million dollars shortfall in the Guam solid waste for FY twenty one. She's allocated eight hundred, and then there is a shortfall already pending one million dollars um, in this this uh, this year fiscal year. Um, the $5 million that she provided, what's, what's worrying me, you know, Mr. Gill, is that 
this money is going to run out. There's no more bailing, you know, Guam solid waste out. So that's why I was asking also for the timeline in which you're going to implement this uh, island-wide um, trash pickup. It's very important. So the finances is a big concern. It's always been my concern with Guam solid waste, you know, as I was watching the numbers. Um, I know that the uh, collection of recyclable is actually a free service that was provided costing almost uh, Guam solid waste $800,000 a year. Is that, I'm, the numbers might be off a little bit, but. Uh, uh, all, all of that, all of those, what I call secondary priorities, which is recycling, household hazardous waste, all those things which are not primary priorities of municipal solid waste, that cost the agency about $1.6 million a year. Six. Sorry, I knew the number was high. $1.6 million a year and the threat of losing the, that um, opportunity is also scary. With all the grants and the opportunities that Guam EPA also has and um, federal government to provide uh, for recycling, I'm hoping that you can find grants within your board to start researching and the agency for these fundings to maintain that uh, you know, incentive for, for us to recycle by providing free services for that. Okay, the other question I have, um, so I'll keep an eye on the expenses with my colleague. I'm part of, a member of her committee. So it is something that uh, I've been watching carefully. So, and, and we're here to help and find ways to, to help Guam solid waste because the last thing we wanna do is have these rates, um, the cost for uh, trash collection to go up especially next year, it's gonna be very trying without this federal you know, money falling from the sky from the federal government. The other one is hiring an attorney. Uh, you talked about the attorney general. Uh, once upon a time, I think the solid ways had an attorney. Um, it was moving forward uh, with your attorney, a private attorney. And then next thing you know, uh, Guam Solid Waste decided to go to the attorney general's office and use an attorney from there. Of course, you've lost, you just mentioned earlier how you lost your attorney and waiting for the attorney general to come up. Now this is, you know, it kind of puts a break on, a, on what you're trying to pursue and all these litigation issues that are coming up. Um, has the board uh, still maintained using the attorney general's office or are you seeking to find private attorney? And do you pay the attorney general's office anyways for their services? Yeah, so good questions. First of all, uh, if the Guam Solid Waste Authority is involved with any litigation, it's handled by the Attorney General's office. We don't have any choice in that. They represent us. They represent the government in, in, the, in those types of cases. So they represent us in the receiver's case, in the receivership case, and consent decree, and all of that. Uh, we were primarily using, uh, looking for an attorney to handle corporate issues, you know, leases, contracts, negotiations, uh, uh, things like that. Uh, we had. Originally, um, the board had an attorney, private attorney that was funded, that was paid for by the attorney general's office. So she was appointed, uh, she was hired as a SAIG, Special Assistant Attorney General, SIH, something like that. I forget the, what, what the exact term. Uh, but then, um, and then and that's how she worked with the board. Her name was uh, Georgia Conception, very capable attorney. While we were going through receivership, the board had that uh, help with that legal representation. The governor of Guam had the attorney general's office representing uh, representing them in the in the actual suit, and the the, the receiver had their own attorney, etc. Uh, then then there was the U.S. attorney that represented the, the U.S. government. Um, but then, uh, due to funding concerns, uh, the um, Elizabeth Barrett Anderson, while she was attorney general, um, came to us and said, "Look, I'm, uh, we don't have the funding anymore to to pay for an external attorney." You can either go hire your own attorney or, or and, and so that's essentially what we went out to try to do. We went out, we put an RFP together, we went out and looked for, for an attorney through the process, got all the way down to the negotiations of, of, with an attorney and it was just too much money for us uh, as, a, as an agency. Uh, and so um, we, we ended up working out a deal with the uh, attorney general's office for using their services for those other types of non-litigation related um, legal issues, you know, um, whether it's, you know, like I said, contractual law, et cetera. And it was less than half of what the private, you know, industry attorney was negotiating. So it, it was a money savings for Guam Solid Waste Authority. 
Uh, I recently asked uh, the management how the response has been. How how has the attorney general been 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 responsive? And their response was favorable. They said yes. Uh, when we when we have questions and we issue them um, a, a question or a, a request for information or things like that, or to review a, a particular contract, they respond to us in a timely manner. And so so I, I was of a similar opinion, um, uh, honestly, uh, Senator. Of you know, do we need you know. A private counsel that could be more dedicated, but my the staff and you know it's, it's hard for me. They 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 you know the the staff and management of Guam Solid Waste Authority said the the current the current situation with the attorney general seems to be working for them, and and it's again le, uh, much lower cost. We pay them uh, at a rate of ninety dollars an hour for their services. And so that's that's how that's how we're proceeding. And now you're without an attorney be, uh, waiting for one to be appointed again to you at the same well, cost? Not, well, they've, they've just changed the way they handle it. Um, we would submit requests through uh, a division over the attorney general's office, and then they would they would they would hand uh, they would parse it out. Sometimes it's Shannon Titano, sometimes it's Carl Espeldon, sometimes it might be another attorney that that would help us. But uh, like I said, I, that was my concern as well, and I asked I specifically asked the management. I said. Uh, are we? Are you getting the services that you need from the Attorney General's office? And the re response came back yes. So. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, thank you so much for those um, answers that you provided, and um, I wish you the very best. Um, like Senator Paris, I know she's been very helpful for Guam Solid Waste, an advocate for it. You know, um, my door is open as well too, if I can be of any assistance and help. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Tidegui. Uh, Senator Jim Moylan, if you have any questions or comments at this time, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Gale, thanks again for uh, accepting the nomination. I'm looking forward to this getting done hopefully by next session. So congratulations on that. And I appreciate your briefing about the island-wide uh, pickup. I recall uh, back in the 35th, we did have, I think it was a special session to get the third uh, cell going, uh, which we were able to get the bond on, which you were talking about earlier. Uh, but there was also discussion about uh, island-wide residential pickup then. Um, at least now in the 36th, I'm, I'm glad the governor is uh, in favor of this and I understand from your explanation that it's the governor's office that will be drafting this, uh, the bill. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that happening to meet your you're supposing the deadline when we can start on this will be uh, next year, I'm sorry, the end of 2022. Uh, so for a public hearing time and uh, getting it into session and passing it, um, we got to hurry that up uh, to make this happen for you. Because uh, I'm sure like what you mentioned, there's a lot of uh, coordination that has to be done to order these trucks and so forth. So do you have an idea when the governor will be uh, submitting this bill to the legislature. Well, like I said, <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to. Uh, I'm. I'm. Um, I, I. I will tell you that um, we're having. I'm having another meeting. I think this week. This either this week or next week, with with her staff uh, on this. Um, where they seem. Uh, they seem pretty anxious to put something out relatively soon um you know when i say that i think maybe maybe this month maybe maybe, maybe next month I'm, i i am not sure uh, i do know that uh, i we had some me uh, meetings with them um at the end of uh in, in december and i've got another meetings uh scheduled again it, it's more of a a, a feedback uh, not only uh, from from guam solid waste authority but from some other Utilities uh, on the island and on how we can on how this would impact um, uh, and how what are the what are the facilities going forward? So um, I, I, I I'm not, I'm not quite sure how the process of what you know the the governor's office introducing legislation is, but I'm I'm guessing fairly soon we would see a a bill a draft a bill being submitted. Okay, I appreciate that. Maybe they can give it an acronym of the Piggy Banking Act of 2022, and we can get this thing going really fast. Um, also wanted to know more if, uh, are they also in discussion with this proposal about the green waste and how that's going to uh, 
if they propose a separate container for that, or how can we help reduce the landfill? Uh, well, since we're not putting the green waste there, how is that currently being done? Or is there something that we need to also discuss here soon? Yeah, um, you know, like like I, I had mentioned earlier, my, you know, well, GSWA's our main concern is municipal solid waste. And, and green waste is not municipal solid waste. I'm not sure what commercial aspects are available. I understand there might be some some commercial um, places that you can take it. I know um, I'm, I'm not sure what a, what other composting is done on, on the green waste. Uh, I do not know of any current, or at least I haven't seen it in any of our current plans for island wide to island wide collection to include green waste. We are planning to continue to do a, a two bin system one bin for municipal solid waste and another bin for recyclables. At the same time, we wanna you know, implement a public uh, information campaign to help reduce our contamination in the recycling bin. The recycling bin are, are seeing contamination rates, 50, 60, 70% contamination rates, and that's, that's not really ideal. Uh, and so we wanna, we wanna one, reduce that uh, as well as uh, maintain our ability to, do the, uh, to, to fund that program. We have been in talks with Senator Pears and her office about the zero waste bill to help, so that we can help continue that program, looking for um, help from the Guam Solid Waste Authority to help us continue that program. We, I think we provided some, some feedback to senators um, on, on that specifically. But yeah, but to get back to your, to your green waste, uh, I, I don't know of any, we don't have any specific plans to implement green waste with our island-wide collection, green waste collection. Okay, thank, thank you. Uh, regarding the recycle, how is that, you know, we have some issues with shipping it off island and what we're going to do with this here uh, as, as collections process improves and we expand it to island wide. What's the plan, uh, what to do with this recycle uh, that we collect from plastics to paper and so forth? Yeah, so yeah, that's a it's an, you know, it's an interesting question that that many municipalities, not just Guam, is, is struggling with. Guam's, Guam's troubles are compounded by the fact that we're an island and there really isn't a local market for recyclables. We'd have to do something with it. And our shipping costs are, like, you know what our shipping costs are. Um, so the, uh, we're, we're, we're proposing to maintain our curbside recycling program so that we can divert what we can from the landfill. Uh, we are working with Senator Perez's office to help us, uh, you know, help us continue running that program um, to help us, uh, you know, if there's some money that can help subsidize it. Because, again, as, as um, was alluded to earlier, this program was implemented without any update in, in the rates, in the, in the residential rates for our customers. Um, and it was implemented originally many years ago by the by the receiver. And at that particular time, there was a market for uh, recyclables. There was a market for um, for um, uh, cardboard. There was a market for plastic. There was a market for, it's so always, there continues to be a market for, uh, for, for cans as well as aluminum cans. And, and so there was a little bit of a uh, revenue share with the processor of these recycling goods. Now there isn't. Now it is a complete, almost completely an expense. It's we separate these and then it's an expense for us to do something with them. Uh, you know, whether it's in some of the, in the plastics waste right now, we actually just put in the landfill. There's no other, it's, it's, it's too much too expensive for us to do anything else with that plastic waste. To want to, to find a, someone who'll accept the plastic waste and then, to, and then to ship it to them. So, so we are hopeful that things will change. I did talk recently to someone in the industry that said there are some things that are opening up in some South Asian, South Asian, uh, Southeast Asian countries that are, have started to accept more of that type of, of, of materials for whatever reason. Um, and so we're, we're hopeful of that. We, we don't wanna, like I said, we want to continue this program um, and, uh, and again, work with Senator Perez and her office to help us, uh, to help us continue to operate that program. And it, so that it won't, that we, we won't have to do something drastic as we, as, as we continue to, tr to uh, keep the uh, authority viable and it's in its primary mission of municipal solid waste collection and disposal. Uh, thank you. 
a uh, couple more questions there as my colleague, uh, Senator Duenas was discussing on the military, uh, providing tipping fees now to uh, solid waste with the opening of Camp Ben Blas, do you have a projection of tipping fees that will be helping support solid waste from the, the Marines? Actually, I, I don't, I, I do not know, have any, have any projections um, on, on what that is. I do know that, uh, as I do understand that they would be customers through a commercial, through one of our commercial um, customers, uh, one of our commercial haulers, uh, they would be um, depositing um, and, and thus we'd be getting tipping fees from, from, from the solid waste that's generated from there. Okay, thank you. And, and finally, you know, before we uh, looking forward to that bill coming from the governor's office, but possibly I, maybe I am interested and maybe other colleagues are interested in taking a field trip uh, before we have a public hearing on that bill to go see some of these uh, uh, cells here and just help me get a better understanding. I, I appreciate that before we have a public hearing and place a vote on that. But thank you, Mr. Gale. I'm looking forward to your confirmation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Moylan. On that, we are you know, happy to provide field trips. Uh, Pedro right there is your man. <laughs> He's, he, uh, he works with very closely uh, with the, our, uh, the lads on operator. Um, I did, I was fortunate enough to go on a field trip as they were constructing cell three. It was a very informative, uh, very informative trip. I met with the, um, not only the builders and the engineers of, of, of that, but also the operator. So yeah, if anybody's interested in Pedro, can 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 handle all that. All right, thank you, Senator Moylan. Uh, Senator Joanne Brown, uh, you're recognized. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and certainly thank you to Mr. Gale for, uh, I have to say, I wish every appointee to any board of commission certainly received the amount of uh, questions that you have. I give you credit for your stamina in going through this, but I think it, it certainly brings to light the importance that we, we still have and continue and need to have with regards to solid waste uh, disposal on island. One of the things I, I certainly appreciate is the fact that you uh, brought up the, um, that the law certainly prohibits incineration with regards to municipal solid waste. And certainly to my colleagues, this has been a long and winding issue. I hope you're mindful of looking into it. I mean, it's been 26 years, obviously, since the initial interest was put forth to move that contract with regards to solid waste. It has a very convoluted and controversial history. So I hope we look at that very carefully. Uh, advocates of that have certainly been trying to move that issue, trying to sell it, that it's, it's going to reduce the amount of waste that we're putting into the landfill. But they don't talk about the cost and the burden that's going to be placed upon our people and the limitations that are put forth within that contract that limit only one company to being able to provide that service. So we don't have what we would expect uh, with regards to ensuring that a project can be put up for bid and that you have competition. So I think before we even go down that road, I think we need to look at the road that previously has been paid with regards to that issue. Uh, most of the questions I had uh, have been addressed, certainly Mr. Gale, and I appreciate your straightforward response with regards to that. I did notice in today's paper that uh, the Solid Waste Authority is looking for getting additional solid waste management, uh, in, I guess, assistance and also financial consulting services. And I just wanted to ask you, uh, with regards to that, because you had mentioned that you had just brought on a new manager. I'm happy to hear that you have a new manager on board. I certainly appreciate uh, the, the contribution your previous manager made, obviously, before he had to leave the island. But uh, could you elaborate on why you're, you're getting these or, or, I guess, advertising for these additional services? Is this something that you already would expect with your new manager? And then also with your financial staff there, would they be able to take care of that? Or is there something beyond the scope of the, the work that they're currently providing to your agency? see that needs additional support yeah thank you thank you for that um senator um to, to answer your question spe we're very specific in what we're looking for with this particular um service um we you know as a uh, guam solid waste authority is regulated by the public utilities commissions for its rates um our rates have today's rates were not were set by, um, were actually recommended by the um, receiver and confirmed by the judge. And so there, and then that rate includes a $30 residential rate, a tipping fee rate with a, with a discount, as well as 
There's a host community fee, you know, if you, if you get a bill, you'll see there's $30 plus a smaller amount. That's the host community fee. Those are all, uh, well, actually the host community fee was actually implemented by the legislature, but the, the $30 rate was set by, set by the court. And so we want, at some point, we need to go and, you know, whether we raise rates, increase, set the rates the same, we will want to create a rate case. We want to have our expertise to go into the front of the Public Utilities Commission to present a, a, a rate case. We've, we've started a straw plan. So, so we have a 10 year pro forma that we worked on in ter both internally and with the governor's fiscal team, a 10 year pro forma that includes our, our rate case for either rates going up or going down. When we implement island wide collection and what we think our revenues would be with the new customer base, we have these projections of what these rates will be. And even if the rate stays the same, I'm an advocate of um of um establishing our rates the way we present our bill to our customers very the similarly that you'd see it from guam solid from guam waterworks authority or gpa and i want to break it down to collections disposal administrative fee etc you know this this 30 dollars flat rate it just kind of mushes everything together and so you don't really, as a consumer, you don't really see what, how that's impacting. And so when certain parts of our um, costs go up, I'd like to be able to reflect that on the bill, just like the way GPA does it on its LIAC or, it's, or the way Guam Waterworks Authority would say, well, look, we're paying for this particular bond and this is what this piece is going for. I'm a, real, I'm a, I'm a huge fan. I, I mean, I really think that's a, a great way to present a utility bill. But in order for us to do that, we have to Chain, we have to go to the, even if I kept the rate exactly the same, I'd have to go, we'd have to go in front of the Public Utilities Commission and create a docket. And then our experts would have to testify and their experts have to testify. So our expertise, our internal management expertise will take us so far. And we're looking for that additional expertise that'll help us present that case uh, to, the, um, to the PUC, whenever that case may be. So we're looking to establish a relationship. It's not something we're looking to do, you know, right away. But we are looking to establish a relationship with a consulting firm that can help us do this as we go forward. Um, we had a staff, we had, you know, originally issued this bid last year and we didn't have any takers. No, there were no bids. Some had picked up, but no one submitted bids. And so again, I was, uh, as a member of the board, I asked for the management to, to, to revise a little bit, to look out, to see if there's somebody else that would do it. Because even if we change the rates the same, I want to do that thing where we break the rates out by individual components, and so and, and we present that on our bill because that's exactly the way our rates, our rate plan, our rate study has been done. It says this is how much it costs to collect, this is how much it costs to dispose, so much it costs for overhead, etc. So and this is reserves. This is, we need we need this amount of money to fund future sales. So I'm, I'm an advocate of, of the way of that kind of itemized bill, and so that's what that's why I wanted the board and you know I, I convinced the board and we we decided to, to look for this expertise. Well I appreciate that clarification. I, I agree with you. I think the more transparency you have with regards to what the actual cost of services and what people are paying for. Uh, even though of course we will angst at any increase, but you know we angst we we don't angst as much for other expenditures we have. But when it comes to dealing with disposal of waste, I mean we we like buying things nice, shiny, you know, shiny and new and the packaging and everything, as I'm sure we just did in this past month uh, for Christmas. But when the time comes for disposal, we just have a very different mindset. We don't think we should have to pay for it. And, and we know that the cost of disposal and doing it properly really is a very expensive exercise. I mean, the, the creation of the landfill, the cells, I mean, we were unable as a community to do this ourselves. I mean, it required a federal court order because unfortunately, waste disposal on Guam became very politicized. The closure of ORDOT, the opening of a new landfill, the cost to pay for it. And, you know, it's unfortunate. I mean, they had to take a federal bulldozer literally and push the process. And a lot of us didn't like it, but leadership at the time didn't stand up to do uh, what was needed to be done to address a safe uh, process of disposing of our waste. And we still have that mindset. We, we want everything new, but when the time comes to throw it away, uh, we just want it to be taken away and somebody else to pay for it as if miraculously money comes out of nowhere uh, to pay for disposal and do it safely. So I know it's a challenging issue, but what is your feeling with regards to the mindset issue within our community about that sense of responsibility? I mean, we have a younger generation coming up that, you know, now is becoming very environmentally conscientious, but you still have a be out there that doesn't feel they have to pay or want lower costs. And it, politically, it's very easy to want to say that. And we want to reduce costs for everybody or, or generally make everybody pay in general uh, to cover the cost for those that are doing illegal dumping. 
Uh, but what are your thoughts, if it's at all possible to set, change the mindset that there actually is a sense of community responsibility we have uh, in properly disposing of the waste that we generate? Because that, uh, that attitude is still out there now. There are people that will say, well, $30 is too much, but we'll spend, you know, $200, which is close to getting what I'm paying on my cell phone, uh, which is, you know, a necessity in my view, but disposal of waste is also a necessity. So uh, what are your thoughts? Is that possible? Is that anything that even the Solid Waste Authority can do in its community outreach uh, to get that sense of community responsibility with regards to safe and proper disposal, including things that we have to send off island that solid waste does not have in their inventory. I was recently looking because I have things I have to dispose of uh, and I see some things that solid waste does take, and I appreciate that. And I know you guys are taking it and literally subsidizing that market to properly dispose of a lot of white goods, computers, televisions. Uh, but there's a whole host of things. You know, what do I do with my old fan? What do I do with the old vacuum cleaner? Where does that go? So I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, Senator, that's a, <laughs> that's a long question. But <laughs> the... Uh, um, as far as you know, public advocacy. I think I think there's a role. There's definitely a role for uh, for um, Guam Solid Waste Authority in there. Uh, our primary role is again meeting our municipal solid waste, uh, you know, collection and disposal um, mandates as set forth by the uh, regulations for you know sanitary uh, living environment. But I, I think there is a role. Um, I have, you know. In this, in this last round of um, this of interviewing candidates for um, replacing the Guam Solid Waste uh, general manager, we were very lucky. This this particular round was was particularly interesting because we had so many qualified candidates. It was it was in the middle of the pandemic, and there were a lot of people that well, sure, I'll come to Guam. <laughs> right? And so it was it was very interesting. We were very lucky to have to have Mr. Slyke apply, but we had another we had another interesting uh, applicant, and her entire role. And it was um, was really advocacy as she so she had a smaller roles within municipal solid waste systems in the states, but her role was advocacy. And it was so these other jurisdictions, these other municipalities are dedicating, you know, part of their resources to advocacy, whether it was advocacy for recycling advocacy for the proper disposal of, of your sanitary waste as proper disposal of, of other things. And she did reach out, outreach programs. She worked with the universities. She worked with the high schools, she worked with elementary schools, and and she was had you know was, had a great interview. Was bubbling. I was going, man. I was talking with other board members. Man, she would be great. It's too bad she doesn't have any of this landfill experience that we really need. But um, that's why I ended up hiring Mr. Slack because that's what we really need. But but what a great you know, advocate. And so it kind of opened our eyes a, a little bit as to what could be done. And 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 I'd like to be able to, and I'd like to say, yeah, you know, we, let's get there, we can get there, but you know, we really have to do the blocking and tackling. You know, you know, it's been a process of us, you know, going from, you know, the what you called it before, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the, the Department of the, the Solid Waste Management was a division of DPW. Going from there to in receivership with the federal bulldozer, as you described. And then, and then, then going through and actually coming through an autonomous agency and, and getting our footing. So we're still there's still a lot of things that we've got to make sure we get the blocking and tackling right. We got to make sure that we can meet those primary objectives. And so that's kind of where my my primary focus has been as a member of the board. But I, I think you're right. I think there is a role for advocacy. There is there is that that you know someone you know like like Peggy Denny an advocacy for. For recycling like like nobody's business i mean and you know I, I think there is that opportunity and we just have to get there as we roll out our implementation of our island wise collection there, there is definitely that is definitely going to have to be there's going to be an advocacy role there whether that's a permanent position going forward or whether that's a temporary thing that we hire you know an agency to help us do you know that those are the types of things that i want to make sure that we get that we implement or, or roll out at least for this particular thing. but there's going to be pushback I, I, i'm sure of it there's going to be sentiment in the community. One of the most frustrating things that I think I share with, with everybody here is, is all of the, you know, the cleanups that would have to happen. And you go to a Tangisan beach and you do a cleanup. And then two weeks later, you go back and you got to do another cleanup. I mean, how do we, how do you solve that? We think island wide collection might help that, but it's not going to, you know, if someone, someone has that, that mentality to do that, it, you know, whether they have a been at home may, may, may help or not, but, but, but you're right. I mean, 
I know. I'm sorry. I apologize for for for. No, I I, I appreciate you elaborating because I, I I do agree, and perhaps at some point when when you as a board determine if you have the resources, uh, that there is a need for outreach and awareness. Because even I'm still taken aback. I mean, I I still am taken aback by the amount of illegal dumping, even just people throwing their cigarettes out the window and everything else, because it shows the total lack of respect for the community that we live in. And I don't think there's any acceptable excuse for anyone doing it. But you're right, there's still a whole population out there that doesn't think twice. I mean, they'll go to the beach, barbecue and have a good time and then leave all their their trash there for somebody else to come and, and experience. And I, I don't understand that mentality. I don't like the attitude. I think we need to be a lot more aggressive with it. And, and we need to say at some point and draw the line, some behaviors are unacceptable and there are consequences to it. But then there's also the issue of enforcement and the lack of it and the challenges and the finances with regards to that. But I think there are things that we can't always just legislate. I think there's just some basic values of responsibility as being a contributing member to this community and expecting people uh, to be contributing members of the community rather than coddling this bad behavior and, and having it be acceptable or not doing anything and speaking out about it. So I do uh, appreciate you elaborating on that. And hopefully, like I said, if you determine uh, as a board that you have the resources, uh, I would recommend the need for that because there's got to be somebody else out there. And 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 all all praise to Peggy Denny. I mean, she's she's a very unique and special individual that's contributed so much to this community. I mean, even since uh, her graduate days at the university, certainly her work at Guam EPA and certainly the advocacy that she does. But I think it would be helpful to Guam Solid Waste to have that also as a, a component, a key component, even though I know you've got a major, major load on your shoulders, essentially to deal with the solid waste issues that, that most people don't find a very public, uh, popular subject, but nevertheless, a critical component of our community. We would not have the public health safety issues without the work that's being done by you and your team at the Guam Solid Waste Authority. But certainly if you guys have the resources, I think that would be an important step because there's really nobody else doing that out there. When you really think with consistency uh, that's needed and the resources and support behind it, uh, we've got a lot of volunteers, but we don't have it at a level probably that's needed to kind of change the mindset uh, of some individuals in our community that don't have that sense of personal responsibility. But with that, Mr. Gale, I appreciate your direct hands-on knowledge. Not every board member that we have come before us um, is it directly aware or informed uh, with regards to their operations, as you certainly have displayed this morning. I appreciate that. I wish we had more people of your caliber uh, and interest um, and experience because you've been at this a while and I appreciate your interest in wanting to continue to, to serve our community and contribute the work that you do to, uh, to the board. Uh, sometimes our community doesn't, you know, they just kind of, well, you know, the expectations, you know, everyone's going to take care of it for us. Uh, but certainly the fact that you stepped up to the plate and you don't have to, uh, that's, that's definitely deserving of recognition. So thank you for your continued service and, and appreciate you responding to my questions. And thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to ask these questions and comment this morning. This is my Senator Brown. And uh, thank you, Chairman Gill. Um, we have one more colleague uh, for questions. Um, so uh, Senator Frank Bloss Jr., you're recognized. Well, the great thing about me being last is everything else has been asked and answered. Um, and thank, again, like as my, was mentioned by my other colleagues, thank you very much for continuing this step up. I mean, you know, it's a big difference between solid waste and since I don't know how you fit that in your time of day, um, but I, you know, I applaud you for that. Um, I look forward to your continued uh, service to to the the board, and uh, you know I I, I like uh, you know some of the things that you talk. There are some questions. I'm sure that uh, we would have about the governor's uh, upcoming proposal, but I'm, I don't want to put you in a position to be able to talk about that until until such time that we do talk about it okay so thank you very much again for your service and thank you madam chair for your uh for allowing me to speak so this is mossy senator blanks uh, and uh, again i want to thank you uh chairman gail for all your service and uh thank you for uh fielding the questions from my colleagues and uh, we, we look forward to your 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 confirmation hopefully in this upcoming session um, so um, being that there are no further questions, I also want to uh, recognize and thank uh, Assistant General Manager Pedro Aguero for being here as well. Uh, currently, there are no questions uh, or testimony at this time. So um, confirmation is due, your confirmation hearing is, is uh, now completed, and, but we, st we are still accepting written testimony until Friday at 4 p.m. this week. Uh, so again, thank you so much and um, have a great day. So it was Masi, uh, Mr. Gill. Thank you. Thank you. So now we're going to move on to the next item of our agenda.
uh, it's uh, to hear testimony on bill number 215-36 COR, uh, sponsored by Senator Tello T. Taitigui, co-sponsored by Senator V. Anthony Ada and Vice Speaker Tina Rosemary Barnes. It's an act to amend section 5127 of sub-article C, article 2, chapter 5, division 1, title 5, Guam Code, annotated relative to commercial leasing of public real property and related facilities. Fisco notes states that by lengthening the term of the agreement to another five years, the proposed legislation provides an opportunity for the government of Guam to collect an extended incremental rental value for rental of public real property. Conversely, extending the term of length means that the base appraised value of the property cannot be reevaluated until the contract lease permit and license has expired. However, the Bureau cannot determine an approximate financial impact at this time due to not having sufficient information on many variables that constitute an agreement for use of public real property, including the appraised value for each property being commercially utilized, the conditions of each agreement and potential increase to property's value should a reevaluation occur, a revaluation occur. So uh, at this time, we have uh, two individuals uh, that are here to testify. Um, Executive Director of Guam Ancestral Lands Commission, John Birch, and Angela, Angela Camacho of the Toronto Land Trust Commission. So I'd like to now uh, recognize uh, Mr. Birch. Um, uh, Madam Chair, uh, would it be okay for an opening of the bill? My apologies, Senator Ted, moving too quickly. Okay, yes, uh, I'd like to invite the sponsor for an opening statement. Uh, so okay. Senator Ted, if you recognize. No worries, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for reading the uh, physical note as well. And, and for scheduling this public hearing on Bill 215-36 and, and for the off opportunity to briefly introduce the measure. Uh, similar to Bill 8-35, which, which I authored during the 35th Guam Legislature, Bill 215 proposes to adjust the number of years a commercial contract lease permit or lease for use for public real property and related facilities by any non-governmental person or entity and shall be solicited, negotiated, entered into or made from a period of five years to a period of 10 years. Madam Chair, a 10 year lease term is authorized provided the terms and conditions of, of the commercial contract lease permit or licensors have been satisfied during the initial five years as evidence in a written authorization by the governor or relevant board of directors. Madam Chair, critical to moving any commercial contract lease permit or license forward involving use of public real property is action by the Guam legislature. With respect to a lease term beyond the current five-year li limit, Guam law requires the legislature to approve or disapprove an exceptional term contract within 60 days from the date of filing such request with the speaker's office. However, the current law does not mandate the legislature to conduct a public hearing and complete committee, uh, committee requirements within a certain time frame, which means the legislature has the option of sitting on a proposal or ignoring it entirely. Whether the loophole in the current law is intentional or not, the Economic Development Authority communicated during our discussions on an earlier version of Bill 21 in the 35th Guam legislature. Specific examples of some of the challenges our government has experienced since the implementation of the current statute in 2013, governing commercial leases for public property and facilities. For an example, as, as, um, and as shared during our research in the 35th Guam legislature, and uh, most recently during the legislative hearing involving the AB WAMPAC, Guam International Airport. Challenges with the current law include a proposed hangar with a lease term of 25 years and a capital investment worth $1.3 million. A proposed animal clinic with a lease term of 25 years and a capital investment of more than 500,000. Never materialize, materializing due to the part to the restricted restrictions contained in the current Public Law 32-40. So Madam Chair, according to Gita, a proposed hydroponic farm with enclosed greenhouses and a pro proposed Northern shopping center also 
never materialized because of the challenges involved with the current five-year lease restrictions. Aside from the economic multiplier effect that may come from allowing the port, airport, Gita, to entering into long-term agreements with interested and qualified companies, there's the question of how many job opportunities we have missed out on. You know, the people of Guam have missed out on because none of these projects materialize based on the restrictions we currently have for the public land and facilities. If nothing else, Madam Chair, Bill 215 should be a good step forward in our effort to support responsible development uh, through property, proper scrutiny by the legislature and effective agencies and through policies that are, are conducive to the good economic growth. Um, Madam Chair, I look forward to working with your committee to ensure that amendments to Bill 215, if any, represent consistency in law with respect to the Chamorro Land Trust, Com Land Trust Commission. <coughs> Excuse me. Excuse me, Madam Speaker. Um, I'm Madam Chair and uh, Ancestral Lands Commission, and that the final outcome of Bill 215 is consistent with other actions the Guam legislature took recently and allowing long-term leases for other areas, including submarine cables um, and youth and community sports program administered through the Guam Football Association. Madam Speaker, you know, Chamorro Land Trust has given the ability to lease property up to 25 years. And, and in some cases, um, license for 21 years. And they're able to do this. Uh, and, and I think Madam Chair, this bill gives an opportunity not to allow a 25 year lease, but you know, at least 10 years. Most companies um, investing into Guam don't see a return until after five years. So um, Madam Speaker, I, I thank you for the opportunity to allow me to, to briefly discuss uh, bill two and five and uh, look forward to hearing the testimony today and providing any insight that may uh, better this uh, legislation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Does Masi Senator Tidigui uh, for your opening statement. Um, so now I'd like to recognize uh, Senator Talina Nelson and Senator Amanda Shelton who has joined us today as uh, does uh, At this time also I'd like to now uh, offer the floor to uh, Executive Director John Birch for his testimony. Uh, thank you for waiting. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, uh, Senator Paris and members of the Committee on Environment, Revenue and Taxation and Procurement. Uh, good morning and a happy new year to all of you. Uh, my name is John Birch. I'm the Executive Director of the Guam Ancestral Lands uh, Commission. And I'm here to testify on bill number 215-36 COR, an act to amend Section 5127 of sub article C, article two, chapter five, division one, title five, Guam code annotated relative to commercial leasing of public real property and related facilities. With respect to bill number uh, 215-36 COR, the Guam Ancestral Lands Committee Commission supports the intent of extending the five year term for exceptional term contracts. While the five-year term limitation established by the current statute is well-intentioned, we feel that it has dissuaded many potential developers and investors from leasing properties that require significant financing and development. Not only because of the difficulty of convincing a financial institution to provide initial financing, but also because of the likelihood of not recouping their investment in such a short term. We understand that the intent of the current statute and bill number 215-36COR is to promote transparency and to assure that all contracts, leases, and licenses are properly re reviewed. But we are concerned that extending the legislative approval process for exceptional term contracts from 60 days to 180 days may further dissuade potential developers and investors. Combined with the established process for RFPs, that's request for proposals for property available for lease. Uh, this could extend the wait time for the evaluation approval for any potential development to about nine months or more. 
An issue that is not addressed in this bill that requires clarification is the decision of civil case number CV1461-4, Gans et al. versus Government of Guam et al. This Superior Court decision concludes that the Crown lands held in trust by the Guam Ancestral Lands Commission are not held for public benefit, rather for the benefit of a specific class, which would potentially take it out of the scope of 5GCA section 5127. Basically, the plaintiffs in this case are members of a larger group of land trust beneficiaries who brought a suit requesting the government of Guam be prevented from transferring crown lands to a smaller group of beneficiaries as mandated by public law 30-158. The court found that the plaintiffs as beneficiaries of the land trust have private property rights in the lots and the stream of revenues generated by the lots sufficient to trigger the protections of the takings clause. In addressing the issue of private property, the court stated, the court does not agree that GLC stewardship of these lands renders the lands public assets such that the lands are subject to legislative repurpose. GALC Legal Counsel Assistant Attorney General Nicholas Tuff advised that this issue must be clarified because the current statute makes specific exemptions for the Chmore Land Trust Commission's residential and agricultural leases, which falls into a similar, though not identical, ownership category, which some courts might interpret as deliberately not exempting GALC crown lands from the current statute. Based on the court decision that concludes that the Crown lands held in trust by the Guam Ancestral Lands Commission are not held for public benefit, but rather for the benefit of a specific class, we are requesting for an exemption from 5GCA Section 5127, similar to what the CLTC has for its residential and agriculture leases. On behalf of the Commission, we look forward to working with the 36th Guam Legislature to resolve these issues. Thank you so much, uh, Director Tuff. Thank you so much, Director Birch, uh, for your testimony. Uh, so at this time, I'd like to recognize um, Angela Camacho from the Toro Land Trust to provide her, her testimony. Half a day, Senator Sabina Flores and members of the Committee on Environment, Revenue Taxation and Procurement. My name is Angela Camacho, Acting Administrative Director of the Tomorrow Land Trust Commission. And I thank you for the opportunity to submit my testimony on Bill 215-36. The Tomorrow Land Trust Commission is supportive of any actions that would have a positive impact on CLTC commercial leasing licensing program. It's a step forward from increasing the commercial lease term from five to 10 years. Although it may not be attractive to potential commercial lessees, licensees for CLTC property. CLTC's Enabling Act authorizes CLTC to commercial license property for 21 years and commercial license property, commercial lease property for 25 years. In addition, CLTC's commercial rules and regulations have been enacted through the passage of public law 33-95. CLTC would like to request that our commercial lease program be exempt from the 10 year limit as we have our commercial rules and regulations in place that govern our commercial program. CLTC is acceptable to comply with the requirements of exceptional term lease if it should exceed the 21 or 25 years as authorized. Sisius Masi for your time and happy new year to everybody. Uh, so Masi, uh, Angela, for your testimony. So this, uh, your testimony, I just wanted for clarification purposes, uh, is re- um, represents Tomorrow Land Trust's position? It is a discussion um, between myself and Joey Cruz, who is our program coordinator. Okay, and um, basically just to, to clarify, you want to get an exemption from the 10-year lease? Um, yes, we are currently governed by public law 33-95. We have our own um, commercial rules and regs, regulation that we abide by. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, thank you for that response. And so uh, Director Birch, is that the same same thing that you're seeking is a an exemption from the 10-year 
uh, yes, uh, Madam Chair, that we would appreciate that. Uh, we have difficult difficulties trying to co uh, convince uh, potential uh, developers and or investors to lease out the raw property that we have. Uh, we've had requests for some properties or some interest in it, but after we placed out the RFP, uh, for example, the one more recently across from uh, uh, well, up on uh, Nimitz Hill, from, across from the old top of the Mar, uh, we have 100 plus acres up there. We received a request from APL about properties located near the port area. And yet uh, there was no submission of any interest for that RFP. And that's within a mile or so from the port. And I'm assuming that that's because uh, there are no, the, the, amount of money they'd have to invest to put access to the raw, to the raw land would be substantial. And for any, uh, any potential investor or developer to put up that kind of money, they would want to have a, uh, enough time to recoup their investments. So we see that has been an issue with us. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, maybe a, uh, another question. So this a question for um, uh, Ms. Camacho. So you were you made an allusion to the rules and regulations, um, and you, you know currently historically there have been many bills in the legislature that seek a exemption or, or long term contracts. Um, so do you think this exemption would be necessary if um, you know there are, there are other avenues allowed to Tomorrowland Trust, uh, for instance through bill form? Is that uh, necessity. Yeah, I think that um, although we appreciate the the um, increase in term from five to ten years, um, again we we um, are held to uh, follow public law um, thirty three ninety five, and and then there's the other process where lessees uh, do go to the legislature to introduce legislation uh, for long-term lease. So um, uh, I'm not sure uh, how uh, or, or if this would um, uh, invite investors uh, to lease government property. Okay, and then the other thing was the terms and conditions. So. There have been breaches in the past, I think, with Tomorrow Land Trust, where um, the leases were uh, carrying out activities that were not, um, I guess, uh, explicit, right, perhaps. Um, has Tomorrow Land Trust uh, developed stringent, um, I guess, rules uh, when it comes to uh, complying with terms and conditions and, and any unauthorized activities? Thank you for bringing that up, Senator. We are... Sorry, we have lost connection. Okay, Sorry. We're back. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. Um, we uh, are standing up our compliance division. Um, and also uh, this year I have issued a cease and desist uh, uh, on a couple of occasions where non-compliance, um, uh, there are non-compliance issues. So uh, that definitely is um, an issue for us and we're uh, dealing with that uh, currently and, and uh, hoping to improve on that as well. Okay, and should there be non-compliance, does that also lead to um... Do you think there's necessary protections to uh, perhaps, perhaps voiding contracts? Is that, should there be something in law as far as voiding of contracts? Should there be non-compliance? I, I believe that's, that's something that the agency is able to do. There's a process already in place where we give notices and, and try to um, get, get the lessee to comply, but in areas where they're not willing to or unable, I believe that's in place. I believe that we are able to terminate. Uh, thank you for the response. I would like to pose that same question to Director Birch. 
um, how confident uh, do you feel about the rules in regards to voiding of contracts if there's any compliance issues? With uh, upholding our contracts, uh, what we do, we don't have sufficient staff here in the Guam ancestral land. So uh, we have outsourced that uh, responsibility to the Guam Economic Development Authority. And I believe that they have the sufficient personnel to make sure that they enforce our contracts. Okay. And then regards to, you mentioned in your, your uh, testimony regarding uh, the lawsuit. And uh, can you at least clarify some of the, the nuances on this bill, how that would affect um, this particular lawsuit? Well, as it has been going on, we have uh, abided by the current statute, although we would like to challenge it, uh, but we don't think we would be able to get any leasee to, to who would like to uh, uh, get a lease from us and take a chance at ch challenging the legislation. But uh, we have conflicting uh, statements on this that basically, according to the uh, the, the conclusion of the lawsuit, the actual decision that the beneficiaries have the right to receive the income from the lease of the land trust uh, properties of the, uh, the ancestral land trust properties. And that income is considered uh, private property. Uh, in fact, all of the income that uh, we receive from any of our leases or licenses are not placed into the Department of Administration but are placed into the uh, uh, Coast 360. And only those that are the properties identified specifically uh, for operations, which is basically the Polaris Point properties are placed into our SID account. The other funds are placed into what we call the land bank are basically locked. So that's considered private property. Uh, the issue is there that while the, the funds and the monies raised uh, and and are considered private property, uh, is it possible that we are able to use public property uh, to provide these funds? And that's what we have been doing over the years. So our legal uh, counsel has advised us that we should uh, clarify this issue because while the one, this one court case in the lower courts and the superior court uh, did state that they disagree that the, um, the properties that uh, ancestral lands has stewardship over is uh, they did it, that it is uh, public property. They feel in this decision that uh, the properties, the crown properties we have stewardship over are considered private. And this was decided in that case, Gans versus the governor of Guam or JLC. Uh, this was because of what many people would refer to as the issue of the Tijan Trust, uh, which was considered inorganic. Um, so we need to resolve this one issue. Are, are the properties we have private? And if they are private, then of course, uh, it will be removed from the scope of the current statute. And if they're public, then we would like to have a clear stating of that. Of course, the issue of it being public with the current statute is that uh, it does place a damper on our ability to lease property out, especially raw land, which we have quite a bit of. All right, to do as Masi, uh, Executive Birch, for your responses. Um, so at this time, I don't have any further questions. I'd like to open it up to my colleagues. Um, Senator Tidegui, would you like to add? Okay, I'll save you for last. Uh, Senator Tony Ada? Yeah, I'd like to go first if you okay. 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 Senator Tidegui, uh, yeah. you're I did see Angie. I think she, um, is she still here, Angie? From Oh, there you are, Angie, okay. Um, the legislation that was introduced would um, all ensure to make sure it does not jeopardize the current um, laws that govern or the rules and regs that govern the Chamorro Land Trust. Of course, you, you don't want to go to 10 years if you get 21 years and 25. That's like an added plus. So there's no intention to jeopardize Chamorro Land Trust. As far as the Ancestral Lands uh, Commission, you know, the issue and question um, that's still pending in the, the Superior Court of Guam is one thing, but um, if 
Mr. Birch, have you um, created your rules and regulations like how what Chamorro Land Trust did when they created their rules and regulations and adopted to allow the 25 to 21 years uh, scenario? And have you done that already with your rules and regs? Are you referring to the land bank rules and regs? Yes, anything that governs. Okay. Yeah, have you created the rules and regs yet? Well, rules and regs were, uh, uh, draft rules and regs were created about in back in 2016 or 17, but uh, they were pretty much uh, tossed out by the attorney general's office. Uh, there were other issues of whether or not we have the authority to create certain rules and regs. So while I was working on that, uh, it was brought to my attention by our legal counsel that there are certain issues that we need to have resolved by the legislature. So what we have done is come up now and we have been working with uh, amendments to our currently uh, our current enabling act that we hope to have uh, once uh, we get it through uh, my commission. I have not even submitted that to my commission as yet. It's still a document in progress. Uh, once we get that to them and if they do approve it, then we hope to submit that to the AG's office for the review and then to the legislature. Uh, we're working at as, on that as quickly as possible. So yeah, there, there have been issues with that. And it's not that uh, the commission has not tried. They have tried in the past, but apparently there are issues that need to be addressed. And some of them, uh, according to our legal counsel, uh, need uh, legislative uh, or at least amendments uh, and legislative action before we can do that. So the money in the land bank sits there and continues to grow. Uh, currently, as of today, we're over $15 million in the land bank. Hopefully, we could one day get that out to the dispossessed landowners and or their heirs. Sorry. So basically, this legislation um, does not, uh, you know, uh, base, you know, with your agency well, and department would not. Well, Go ahead. Well, well, what it does do is it moves it in the right direction, like uh, uh, Director Camacho stated, uh, of allowing us more, allowing us more opportunity, or at least to encourage others to, or investors or developers, to look at government property for rent. That, and in our case, would build up the land bank. These are most of these properties that we're we're seeking to to lease out uh, would go to the land bank. The only exceptions would be uh, about. 43 acres at Polaris Point, everything else would go into the land bank for compensating the dispossessed landowners. Mm -hmm. And this would greatly help us to move in that direction as we move forward to uh, getting uh, our rules and regs approved. And part of that, of course, is to get uh, to amend the law, uh, our enabling act first. And that's what I was advised of more recently within the last month or so by uh, legal counsel that that's the direction that I must work on. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for explaining that. Uh, you know, this legislation was um, intended for areas such as, you know, the airport, um, Port Authority, uh, as well as Gita, you know, because they are, you know, under the, the, the law, the current law that only allows them five years. And um, I think that's what we're mostly, you know, uh, addressing the issues that they have with just such such a short term um, and lack of investment. So um, I'll ensure, though thank you so much for testifying, um, I'll ensure that this does not jeopardize your agencies whatsoever and maintaining that. I did get a text from the chairman of the Guam Airport Authority. Um, he didn't realize this the public hearing just now saying, hey, I heard public hearing is going on in this. He will submit testimony. He's in favor of the legislation. In fact, he's asking longer than 10 years. <laughs> he's asking for like 20, which, you know, I, I, I could see their point because how come Chamorro Land Trust, you know, they're given the ability of going 21 years, 25 years, uh, but other agencies are not. So um, Looking forward to their testimony as well as Gita. I spoke to someone from Gita yesterday, but unfortunately they're not here today as well. So hopefully these testimonies will come in if they really need this type of, you know, initiative, especially during a time like this and COVID and bringing any kind of investment into Guam would help, you know, our economy. 
the way it is right now. So other than that, um, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, and I'll, I'll do a closing after my colleagues had an opportunity to ask any questions. Thank you. And thank, happy new year to the to both of you, uh, Camacho and, and Birch. Thank you again for being here. This is Masi, Senator Tadigui. Uh, Senator Ada, uh, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, uh, Mr. Director Birch. How are you doing this morning? Happy New Year. Thank you, Senator Ada. Uh, we're, I'm doing very well this morning and That's this good. year. <laughs> you know, and, and listening to your 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 comments and statements on um, Public Law 3240 uh, and this bill before us, do, perhaps maybe do you think that 30, 3240 should just be repealed, uh, more more like Section One, where we just uh, eliminate this uh, this uh, what they call it, this five year uh, hold on on properties, and uh, perhaps maybe just ex uh, do the uh, exceptional term contract to where it has to go to the legislature. Uh, yes, that will make it a lot easier on us here at the Guam ancestral lands to move forward. It seems to be an impediment as far as uh, us uh, keeping interested uh, parties uh, interested in, in the properties that we have. Like I said, the one recent case with APL and with us making the effort to advertise or to RFP the property out uh, and no one responded. I mean, uh, that seems to be the, the trend at this point. And we are in an economic crisis at this time. And it's important for us to try to generate as much as we can uh, business in this island to help us survive and, and pull out of this thing. Yeah, so, I totally agree yeah, with you. Anything would help that will help us move forward. Um, of, of course, the court decision at the lower court did state that the properties and ancestral lands has in their view, uh, is private, but then again, I feel that, and our legal counsel feels that that could be challenged in the future. And that's mm -hmm. how come we've opted to stay within the, the statute and follow the statute as currently written. Uh, but we would like an exemption from it altogether, if that's possible. Yeah, but I, I think, do understand uh, the reason for it. Yeah, I do yeah, understand the reason back for in the day, it being there. Yeah, back in the day when this was first introduced, uh, I. Uh, public law 3240 you know that's uh was understandable but i, I think during these times of uh you know trials and tribulations and uh you know we, we you're right we need to do what we can to generate whatever income that we can uh, into this government and uh try and do what we can to build our, our general fund as well but uh i i think that that's something we can also look at and see how we can actually uh, amend amend this bill to uh, just probably take out section one of public law 32-40 and just go with uh, the exceptional term and see how we can work it in. I, I'll, I'll work with the uh, the prime sponsor of the legislation and uh, see what we can do. But thank you for your comments on that. I appreciate it. Thank That's you. the only question I have, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, thank you, Senator Ada. Senator, who's next? Senator Moylan. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you to the uh, to the presenters. I appreciate the information. I have no comments. I'll, I'll review this further and probably get online and talk to you both later on. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Senator Marlin. Senator Chris Duenas. This is uh, this is Masi, Madam Chair, and I I really concur with the previous speaker, Senator Ada. So I guess what I would pose to both uh, uh, Senator, or excuse me, uh, John Birch, uh, the executive director, as well as uh, Mrs. Camacho, is, is the, um, it just seems like what's being discussed here is, is, is really a, a departure and, and maybe the, the good intentions of the original five-year placement. But I remember the debate on that bill was basically fundamentally that, that bringing and reining in legislative control uh, at, or input in terms of leases and terms going forward. So um, I wanna just elicit a comment from you on what Senator Ada had proposed. And, uh, and, and also um, basically if, if you just believe that, um, that the final disposition of, of legislative uh, approval is, is something that uh, uh, basically the check and balance here other than uh, incremental uh, changes which this bill proposes. 
Well, Senator, I guess that's to me. Uh, I believe that we have already existing laws that uh, make up the various agencies, uh, the directors and their board members. And we are basically confirmed and presumably granted authority uh, to act in our official capacities uh, to include disposition and management of our respective agencies and needs. And that would include leases and licenses uh, to negotiate those things. We do have a, uh, an extremely bureaucratic uh, RFP process that does take time. We're currently right now of ancestral lands in the negotiation process of uh, 13 acres at Polaris Point. Although I can't speak of who is involved or what, what is going on with that, it has taken us almost two, maybe three months to get to this point. And if we add on the ex additional uh, participation of oversight from the legislature, uh, even if we do extend, you know, the uh, if we do extend the the overview by the legislature from the current uh, sixty days to one hundred eighty days, that could take this into over nine months or more. And a person in the private sector trying to invest their time and their money into this means that uh, their costs will increase dramatically. Uh, and this is another issue that they have and why some of them would opt more and have actually asked us if we're aware of any private property owners in the vicinity uh, that they're interested in. Of course, we tell them that's something they would have to work with with the private owners in that area. Um, uh, we're interested in building up the land bank and taking care of, uh, of the, of the uh, beneficiaries that we're charged with by our enabling act. And uh, so we wanna do what we can do best for all of them. And, and if we can do a, and raise as much funds into the land bank, perhaps we can start making payment one day. But uh, although it may see, be, seem a significant amount that we have in there right now at $15 million as of today, uh, to reimburse these people, that will be pennies per acre. Uh, it's not enough. And, and the way we're set up right now, it, it seems to be a deterrent more than anything else for us to, to raise the funds that we, that we do need to raise. So yes, I, I agree that uh, to exempt us from the, this statute would be great. It would give us more flexibility. I believe that there's enough rules and oversight into how we operate in our agencies that will control us. Um, you know, the intent was great to, you know, to uh, as far as bringing more awareness to what we're doing in the agencies, but uh, what it has done in retrospect uh, is extend the timelines. And that I have to admit uh, has been a problem. Uh, more recently, uh, for example, we do have a lease agreement with uh, AT&T, it's a license agreement. And it's a five-year uh, license. They inquired about a uh, long-term lease of 50 years. Uh, but because of the issues of uh, bringing this before uh, the legislature for their review, after they go through our review and contract negotiations, uh, they have somehow uh, gone quiet on that. They haven't gotten back to us on it. Uh, the term for their contract for at and will expire in September of 2024. So knowing that uh, if they would like to continue operations out here and continue their lease agreement with agreement with ancestral lands, uh, they would soon have to either agree to work uh, and, and for us to submit a determination need to the legislature and, and go through the process that will take quite a bit of time or else seek uh, rent or lease from uh, somewhere else. And we'd like to keep them. They, that, the land, the, the revenues raised from that lease go exclusively into the land bank trust. Yeah, and as I go to um, uh, Mrs. Camacho, I, I, I think that the, the purpose of my line of questioning is of course we just passed legislation for with regard to GTA and, and, and that went legislative route. I, I think what we're experiencing here right now is that we have a really have a hodgepodge and inconsistent 
methodology here. And I'm, I'm wondering, I guess I will also do a follow up with both of you. Did you write to the land committee in terms of your, uh, your position as well on this bill so that uh, maybe we need a, a round table and, 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 and an oversight to be able to kind of co, you know, coalesce this effort to, to maybe come to a, a, a uniform decision. So uh, Ms. Camacho, I want to get your opinion. Yeah, I definitely think that this bill has brought to light uh, several things um, that has been brought up by other people in this discussion. Um, we do need to think about increasing business activity to increase um, funding to the general fund. Um, also, I, I will say that uh, the, there are processes in place now that allow for transparency. Um, uh, for example, with the exceptional uh, term lease, it, it has to go through the legislature. So anything for us above 21 or 25 years, um, we, we do go to the legislature. So um, I, I think that's an excellent idea, Senator, that there be a roundtable discussion so that perhaps, I mean, I, I will say that um, Tomorrow Land Trust has been able to work with um, our current uh, rules and regs, however, there may be room to make it uh, even more attractive so um, and beneficial to our people. So definitely that's that's a great recommendation. Mr. Birch, um, do you share that uh, that sentiment? Yes, I do. Okay, because I, I mean, you know, we, we have to make a decision at some point. I know that there's been of, of varying degrees with regard to viewpoints in the legislature, particularly in the land committee and some others, that you know that that what what do we do? You know, we're sitting here and we've been discussing the fact that uh, you know we we're, we're really like to see ARP funding. Uh, you know, the legislature put in uh, twenty five million dollars with recommendations for development of Chamorro Land Trust infrastructure. With the current um, work that you've done at the CLTC to identify properties that are ready for development. In fact, I think you've just uh, recognized down uh, uh, recently in your board meetings. Uh, some property that, that actually is, is ready to go pretty much, shovel ready for infrastructure projects. And so as we move forward, I mean, we have to make a decision. What are the funding sources for, for this? You know, uh, we, we have not made that commitment right now uh, with regard to general fund revenues or, or, or any other revenues really, other than relying on, on lease agreements and, and the inception of that, uh, that, that you know, uh, interchange of ideas. And so, th so that's why I make the recommendation is that, is that I think we need a cohesive um, um, you know, effort going forward and, and a solid commitment um, you know, to following through on, on these promises uh, as opposed to um, you know, kind of a, what I view it right now as a kind of a hodgepodge situation, as you mentioned, Ms. Camacho, that you know, if all else fails and, and timelines are an issue, then it does seem to fall back on the legislature and legislation in order to do this. So I think Uniformity is what I'm looking for, and maybe that's what uh, this is generating at this point. So, Madam Chair, I, I do make that suggestion that maybe we do a, a co-round table with the land committee to discuss these issues. I don't have any other comments at this point. I'd like to listen to uh, the further uh, disposition of our colleagues. Jesus Masi. Jesus Masi, Senator Duenas. Uh, Senator Joanne Brown, do you have any questions or comments? Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I I certainly appreciate the interest in wanting to expand the timeline with regards to leasing of government property without legislative review or oversight with regards to approving leases. Obviously, one of the authorities of the legislature is to address approval of leases of government property. I think the proposal about talking about how it's going to, you know, stimulate additional money into the government coffer sounds very nice. Uh, but I think the government of Guam has a whole history, unfortunately, of the misuse of leasing of government property. And I certainly bring forth the YTK case because I've had to, in the six years of the port, deal with that particular issue. And that came about after the Guam legislature introduced a bill to allow five-year leases. I was the only member of the legislature at the time that did not vote for that bill 20 years ago, not knowing years later, I would end up being in a situation not of my doing, but of other parties. Uh, authorizing a lease agreement that did not meet the law requirements. And it spent many years and probably a significant amount of great pair money uh, to fight that particular case that went all the way to the Supreme Court of Guam where the Supreme Court of Guam eventually ruled 
uh, that the Port of Guam and the ratepayers and the people of Guam did not owe any money on a lease where an individual company had taken out a lease for five years, did not pay their lease, did not meet the conditions of the lease, and then tried to claim all of a sudden they had a 40 plus year lease agreement with the, with the Port Authority that did not go through the Guam legislature. Uh, the Guam Chamorro Land Trust has a whole history of misuse of lease of Chamorro Land Trust property. And I know because I had the opportunity when I was at the university in an agreement with Chamorro Land Trust to actually sit through and go through many, many, many of those lease agreements to include the lease of the property uh, for the golf course that had a very long controversy because while they were using the property, occupying the property, they were not consistently paying their lease money to the Chamorro Land Trust. And that is just a more notable, more visible case because of the size of that particular project. But there were many, many, many other leases that Chamorro Land Trust had that they were not aggressively following up and ensuring that the leases of these properties were properly paying their lease agreements. They were also not following up and making sure that the conditions with regards to how the property was to be used, how the property was to be maintained, how to ensure that if the leases of those properties further sublease those properties to other parties, uh, they were not ensuring that those subleases were also being paid uh, their fair share of funds into the Chamorro Land Trust. So I think we need to be very cautious, colleagues. It sounds very easy. I mean, just simply saying five to 10 sounds good to me, but I think we need to look at the broader issues where public assets that are owned by our people, unfortunately, for whatever reason, there are other parties out there who think that when it's government of Guam property, hey, we can always get a good deal. We make sure we donate to that particular campaign or that particular administration, whatever the case may be, uh, to try to take advantage in some cases, not all, but in some cases of these public assets. Also, because there is no consistency in the public announcement. I mean, I would like to ask Mr. Birch, he had mentioned that there's a party that's interested in leasing some property down there next to the port. I wanna ask, how did that come to be? I mean, how did that particular party have an interest in that property? Was it publicly announced? I don't normally see such announcements in the paper uh, for ancestral lands, but maybe I'm not looking carefully. Uh, but how do you go about uh, having your properties leased? Is there a set process so that anyone who may have an interest in that particular property can bid on it equally with everybody else? Could I come and bid on it like anybody else in the community? Would I know it's available? Or is it only an interested party coming and knocking on your door and saying, hey, we'd like to lease this. We understand you own this property and we'd like to lease it. I mean, how, how do you go about leasing your lots and how do you go about uh, publicly announcing it so everyone knows that that particular property is available so there's fair and competitive interest in those leases when they're supposedly executed. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, yes, we do publicize it and when APL, in this case, I'll, I could use APL because they are I seem to be disinterested at this point. Uh, <clears throat> when they came to us and made a request, uh, that they were interested in properties that we may have in the general location of the port. Uh, we looked at our properties and we informed our property managers or GITA and they, pre they created the RFP, which was advertised uh, in, in the public news uh, media. Uh, I forget for how many days uh, for any interested parties that come who might be interested in leasing these properties out. But first we, we generally wait until we receive any request of interest, but then we don't, as at least since I've been here, go out and simply exercise the authority to uh, grant licenses to that particular individual. Uh, we want to be careful uh, that uh, we do not violate any laws. So yes, we do go through the RFP process that requires review, evaluation, and advertisement. And uh, we've, uh, uh, since, because we don't have sufficient staff within uh, ancestral lands, we've outsourced that responsibility to the Guam Economic Development Authority. And they've been pretty good at this. Uh, but of course the process is a lengthy process. And I believe that we should stick to that to guarantee that uh, transparency and ensure that all contracts uh, and licenses are properly reviewed. Uh, so, that's basically what we do. So do other people, can you come in and, and, and apply for those properties? The answer is yes. Yeah, but see, that's a backward process. And, and I think that's where the issue is because if I'm, I'm this company or anybody else, if I have my eye on a certain piece of property, 
rather than that, and I, I appreciate the fact you're saying now Gita advertises it, but what, what initiates that process is not the is not the Ancestral Lands Commission itself saying this is our list of inventory that we have available. You know, we, we advertise quarterly or they can access that information so that anyone and everyone who may have an interest can look at that particular property if they want to. And this is our bidding time. These are our bidding terms and, and you meet it or you don't. Uh, it's, it's an interested party that brings the issue to light. And then as a result of it, we go and advertise it. Uh, and that's that's kind of been the way it's happened for a long time. And I think I have a problem with that because I myself, like I said, I've directly had to experience what has happened as a result of public officials misusing their positions uh, and entering into lease agreements that are not to the advantage of the people of Guam. And then we're ending up stuck in court. That's where we end up, my dear colleagues. We end up stuck in court sometimes for years to try to ensure that these parties are not misusing and abusing the system. And so I think until we come up with a better transparent process and how properties are identified, how they're advertised, how there's an equal opportunity for anybody, whatever interest who wants to uh, get uh, and you know, follow through or maybe want to bid on a piece of property, I think we have to need some consistency in how that's done to ensure that it's done properly and it's done fairly because there's been too much when it comes to money and by all means when it comes to land. And we've had a whole sordid history all the way down to, you know, you have to prohibit attorneys from taking land as payment because that used to be the process. Families on Guam lost acres and acres of land uh, because they couldn't pay their bills. And that ended up being used as a means that parties could get their hands on land. And I think we need to be very careful with regards to, we talk about how precious land is, but these are public assets that we're talking about. We're not a business. Let's get that out of the way right now. We're not a business. And we have a responsibility to ensure that public assets are used properly. And we've had a lot of sordid history, unfortunately, including public officials that have been involved with their own fingerprints all over uh, the misuse of how land has been leased. So I didn't support five years because I feel that even though you hear companies say, oh, it's a laborious process. Oh, we don't want to go through the public exposure of having to go through the legislature legislature. And I God, I, I don't blame them. I don't care for the legislature most of the time myself. But it is a public process with regards to public assets that are owned by our people so that there is open scrutiny. And there's a need for that. If it's simply left, if you really think that it's all done at the board level and it's all done properly, and it's all wrapped in a, a nice little bow. I think we have too much history that tells us otherwise. And I think we need to be very careful about that. And if these companies are really serious about what they want and what they need, uh, they'll do what they need to do. They also have the option because, you know, it's not like the government land bank is the only resource of property available. There's many other public private properties that are also available out there that they want to choose to go that route. They can also choose that route. Nothing prohibiting from doing that. We don't own all the land on Guam. So it, to make it seem like, oh, these projects aren't happening because, oh, we didn't get this lease through. Uh, if they're serious enough about what they want to do, the general location of where they want to do it, they're going to do it with or without us. Let's not kid ourselves. If they know that there's money that can be made and they can do it well, uh, I'm sure they're going to execute that interest. But I don't think that should simply be the reason why we change, oh, let's go from five to 10 and let's increase it because that's going to give us more money and the problems are going to go away. I think you need to look at how much it's costed the people of Guam because of the misuse of this lease process. Mr. Birch mentioned he doesn't have enough resources within his operations, and I appreciate him being upfront about that reality, but neither does the Tremoral Land Trust. Because the Tremoral Land Trust right now, we don't have to go very far if we dig just a little bit in to find out how there's a lack of compliance with regards to residential leases, agricultural leases, and commercial leases. Even to this day, there's no doubt, it would not take much effort to do that because that pretty much is most of the time, that's the standard. That's not the exception. So while I appreciate the interest in wanting to, to move this forward with regards to expanding the time concerning these lease agreements, I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done to ensure we have some type of consistency and we have some type, a higher degree of public accountability and public review with regards to public lands. Because when we're talking about leasing something for 25 years, for many people, that's half their lifetime. We're talking 50 years, a uh, little less. We're talking 100, oh my goodness. None of us you know, will probably reach that time frame. So we need to be very cautious about what we're doing. We also need to be cautious about the terms and whether or not we're putting provisions in these lease agreements that actually increase by percentage over time, the amount of money that's being paid. We need to value these public assets a lot more carefully than we've done historically. We've not done a very good job about that. So I have to say, as I did 20 years ago, I didn't 
support the five-year lease agreement because the intent was to make sure it didn't come through the Guam legislature. They said, oh, it's a short-term lease. At least allow us to do short-term leases. And look at the mess that got the Port Authority of Guam into. I don't even know what, what the airport situation is. Uh, but I think we need to be a little more careful in how we proceed with regards to because it's not as simple and a clear cut as simply extending it from five to 10 years. I think we're complicating things a lot more without addressing the underlying issues that have created these problems. And it's going to take a lot more work. It's going to take a lot more work than simply passing the legislation. I understand certainly the intent of my good colleagues, Senator Tello, in, in wanting to move this forward, colleagues. But again, I think we need to be very cautious about what we're doing with regards to the lease of public property. And the role of the legislature it is within our authority, my dear colleagues. That's why these lease agreements come to the Guam legislature. I mean, earlier this year or last year, we dealt with a GTA issue. Uh, and that had its moments, but nevertheless, it, had, it went through a public review process. We were taking public assets and we made a public decision about it, but it met the light of day. It met that review. Uh, and to have similar properties, to not go through that level of scrutiny, particularly when these are long-term agreements that are putting these properties aside, I don't think we should continue to abdicate our responsibilities, especially because the history of how these lands have been used under these department and agencies that have nowhere near the level of scrutiny as a public review process in the Guam legislature. I think we need to be very, very careful about that. With that, Madam Chair, I don't have any further comments with regards to this bill. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. This is Mossy, Senator Brown. Um, so I'd like to now recognize Senator Frank Bluss for his, uh, for any comments and questions. Nothing at this time, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Senator Bluss. Senator Talina Nelson, uh, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I don't have any questions, but uh, just to be very um, upfront with, with my thoughts on this bill. Um, I know our colleagues have discussed uh, that there's a need for incremental change um, and repealing section one is not an incremental change. Uh, we are moving this, um, this licensing from five years to 10 years inclusive, inclusive of any extension option or renewal. Um, I do not agree with that provision. I do agree with a, our former, uh, our colleague that was speaking earlier uh, about her concern on how we are uh, giving the agencies these kinds of authorities to issue out uh, land use and leases for commercial entities. And I do share that same concern uh, with the situation of YTK down at the Port Authority of Guam. Also, Madam Chair, if you look at the fiscal note, this is $822,108,769 worth of public property. And we are looking to abdicate this type of responsibility for the agencies. And we've seen in the past, the recklessness and the political favors that were done for certain businesses or corporations. And so, um, I cannot support this bill at this time. All right, thank you, Senator Nelson. Um, so uh, I would like to now offer the floor for uh, Senator Tidegui to close on. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to uh, those again who testified and, and to my colleagues and their concerns, you know, uh, the bill was introduced in the 35th Guam legislature at the request of, well, basically um, agencies like the Port Authority uh, Airport, uh, most especially the airport and Gita. Um, they were having difficulties, you know, getting leases approved. And, and I, I think it's not necessarily just because of the five year to 10 year. It was because a section in the law currently right now reads that um, in, as I mentioned in my opening, the current law does not mandate the legislature to conduct a public hearing and compete, complete committee requirements within a certain time frame, which mean that uh, means the legislature has the option of sitting on a proposal or ignoring it completely, it's in entirety. 
So even if legislation is created or um, a request is made by uh, an agency for a lease longer than five years, um, it goes to the legislature and there is no mandate to act upon it at all. So that I think needs to be addressed and changed that at least the legislature should act upon these, these requests from the agencies. Um, you know, I understand the concerns of my uh, certain senators, you know, with regards to the abuse that has been done, but, you know, um, I think transparency, accountability with these agencies uh, need to be addressed more so than the, than the law itself. If they don't follow certain rules and regulations um, in moving forward on leases, agreements that are put together by their agencies, then that, that's an issue. Now, how do we address that? Um, RFPs that are put out, uh, Mr. Birch mentioned that, you know, it was brought to the attention of Gita and um, Gita then sent out an RFP and it, it does sound like the back door <laughs> going backwards on something like this. But, um, you know, if we have property that is sitting there doing nothing and can generate revenue for our island, then I think it's an, a step that we need to, to um, pursue and, and do it in the right way, you know, transparent. Transparency is first and foremost. And if there's rules and regulations, we have to put in, you know, make it even more, you know, strict on providing these uh, agreements, then so be it. Then that's something that we need to look into. But um, other than that, you know, uh, I will definitely take the consideration of the comments that were made. And if this bill doesn't have the support it needs um, by my colleagues, then I definitely don't wanna move it forward. Um, so I will talk with the other agencies that have not, were not here today and, and talk with my colleagues and hear their concerns. But um, they are valid concerns. And I appreciate the time um, that you provided me, Madam Chair, uh, with hearing this legislation. Thank you so much. Madam Chair, if I may. Uh, yes, Senator Wayne. Senator Wayne. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure it was clear uh, because I concur with Senator Brown. And I think what Senator Ada was talking about was exactly that. With the repeal, it would be back to concurrence from the legislature. So I just wanted to make sure that was clear on the record. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Thank you, Senator Duenas. And um, uh, I want to thank all my colleagues that, have, uh, that are here today to provide uh, input and testimony for this for this legislation or this proposed legislation. And I also wanna thank uh, Executive Director Birch as well as uh, Angela Camacho from Toronto Land Trust. Um, we are still accepting testimonies until Friday, uh, January 7th. Um, and so uh, the time is now 1127. Uh, bill number 215-36 is now duly heard. Um, so we are now gonna move on to the next agenda item. It's to hear testimony for bill number 224-36 COR sponsored by, by myself, Senator Sabina Flores Perez, co-sponsored by Senator Tello T. Taitigui and Senator Joanne Brown. It's an act to repeal chapter 19, division three of title 30 Guam administrative rules and regulations, and to add a new chapter two to title 12 Guam administrative rules and regulations relative to clarifying insurance and continuing education. Notices were sent to Department of Revenue and Taxation, HEDA, uh, along with other uh, private public sectors uh, stakeholders, also the Guam Chamber of Commerce and Guam Women's Chamber. The fiscal note waiver was received. Uh, it was noted that the bill is administrative in nature and poses no fiscal impact upon any funds of the government of Guam. Uh, we did receive written testimony by Alice Sebastian Cruz, Acting Regulatory Programs Administrator, um, which I will read later, but I would like to now introduce, provide some introduction uh, introductory comments uh, for Bill 224. Uh, this measure updates the continu continuing education requirements for licensed insurance professionals in Guam. And by updating the regulations, this bill aims to ensure licensed professionals are up to date with the insurance industry standards and practices, which protects consumers with insurance needs and services. Bill 224-36 updates current regulations by requiring completion of 14 credit hours of continu continuing education credits to include six credit hours per class of insurance, six credit hours of either insurance specific or general courses, and two credit hours of ethics courses uh, to be done annually. 
In addition, adjusters are required to complete 14 credit hours of continuing education, which also includes two credit hours of ethics training every two years. Bill 224-36 proposes the following changes to current regulations. Any continuing education credits exceeding the required number of hours may be carried forward up to a maximum of four years. Repeated courses are allowed um, after five years have transpired. Uh, online courses are also allowed upon uh, approval by the commissioner. Uh, any person failing to meet continuing education requirements shall be subject to 90 day suspension until such time the person demonstrates compliance. Uh, there is a requirement of completion for 30 credit hours of pre-licensing insurance courses and subsequent passing of insurance examination for all, all applicants. There is an exemption for those 65 years and older who have been continuously licensed for 25 years and in good standing with an affidavit that supports the claim to the commissioner's um, office with subsequent approval. Bill 224-36 was developed in close collaboration with Department of Revenue and Taxation and reorganizes insurance regulations under Title 12 and GAR. Um, I would like to thank my co-sponsor, Senator Tello Tidegree and Senator Joanne Brown, and I look forward to testimony and public input. So uh, I would like to now read into the record um, testimony by um, Ms. Sebastian Cruz. Uh, my name is Alice P. Sebastian Cruz. I'm an acting regulatory programs administrator for the Department of Revenue and Taxation's regulatory branches general licensing, insurance, banking, weights and measures, and compliance branch. I want to thank the Honorable Senator Sabina Perez, Honorable Senator Tello T. Tidegui, and Honorable Senator Joanne Brown for accepting our request to look at the proposed revisions of the present insurance law on continuing education section. The statutes of the insurance law in Guam were codified over 30 years ago, and during that time, insurance companies doing business in Guam were just a handful and well manageable. Throughout the years, insurance business, local and nationwide, started to flourish, and many foreign companies took interest in doing insurance business in Guam. And every year, the number of both domestic and foreign insurance companies registering to do business in Guam rises up, along with federal insurance mandates that ideally and usually applicable to local insurance laws as well. When insurance companies come to do business in Guam, they are to secure local general agents to act in their behalf and to hire and recruit insurance producers to promote and sell their products. In the past, the education requirements provision of the insurance law was not implemented properly. In insurance producer applicants get licensed without being required to present pre-licensing certificate and when seeking renewals. Licensees may or may not present proof of continuing education and still get licensed. We at the insurance and banking branch has the foremost mandate, among others, to protect the welfare of the consumers and or taxpayers, not only insurance, but on other sections we serve. In an effort to elevate Guam to be up to par with best licensing practices with all other states and insurance business and to make sure that the prospective policyholders are getting proper information regarding the insurance products and benefits, the insurance pr producer offers them. We want to make sure that the producer has the knowledge and expertise to deliver the best service to the people of Guam and to all other clients he or she may sell insurance to, be it health, life, or property and casualty lines of insurance. This proposed bill of pass into law will not only weed out the ones that are in business without proper knowledge of the craft, but will also bring out prospective insurance producers that excel in the field by learning and passing the pre-licensing test and henceforth confidently present the products, confidently present the products to prospective clients where they can clearly explain what to expect with the products being presented to them. I'm in favor of Bill 224-36, Alice P. Sebastian Cruz. So that is uh, the testimony that we've received and uh, I'd like to open the floor to my colleagues for any, any questions at this time. Uh, uh, we can also pass on any questions to DRT uh, since the representative is not here today. Um, Senator Tony Addo, if you have any questions or comments at this time, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. It's just, uh, you know, I'm just concerned that we didn't have anyone from the from the department here to uh, chime in on this uh, legislation and that we could ask them questions as well. Because the question I just wanted to ask them is what prompted uh, the complete repeal and reenactment of the rules and regulations. So hopefully, you know, um, we can go back and uh, have another hearing where they can be present or uh, so that we can ask them questions as well. I think um, just 
because looking at the the legislation online, I, I don't I don't even see any legislative intent or anything of that nature, and it's just a matter of what what questions now we we need to further ask and. and um, most especially the uh, you know what what prompted this complete uh, repeal and reenactment and you know is it warranted or is it not warranted uh, those type of things so I'll, I'll just um, hopefully we'll be able to have that opportunity to ask them that's the only qu uh, concerns I had thank you madam chair all right thank you senator Ada. if I can uh, maybe add a little information so um, in GAR, there is an insurance a chapter on insurance so the the idea was very simply just to combine all the insurance regulations under one chapter. Um, so uh, there were additions to the regulations. So a lot of that was brought forward uh, when, when it was moved from, I believe, Title 30 to Title uh, 12 of GAR. Uh, so a lot of that was moved forward, but with the additions and the um, modifications that was mentioned earlier, and I'll be happy to, to go over that with, um, with um, my colleagues. Uh, to show like the details of what was uh, changed and what was kept. So, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just you know uh, surprised it wasn't included with the piece of legislation to show what uh, you know what those would be. Or, but I, I'll wait for your um, a meeting with you or our colleagues. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate the question. Thank you, Senator Ada. Uh, Senator Joanne Brown, you recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. I really won't take up much time. I, I certainly would, if we did have any feedback from Revan Tax and other parties would be appreciated. Hopefully by the time, if this bill uh, is scheduled to, to be put before us that we will have more feedback, but otherwise as a co-sponsor, I certainly support having these standards in place. I mean, people in our community pay money into these companies with the expectation that, you know, there will be follow through and that their, their investment essentially by making, making these payments, uh, you know, will be followed through with. We certainly want to make sure the parties that are performing this work uh, meet national standards. So uh, I appreciate it and, and certainly support this legislation. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator Tidegui, uh, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I'd like to thank you for all the work that you did in this legislation. It actually is, um, if you read the um, current statute, well, not statute, it's in the GAR. If you read the current GAR, even the definitions were uh, concerning. And by, um, you know, rewriting this, this section in GAR is, is clearer, much more clear, especially when it comes to the definitions. Um, the, the, pre, uh, the new section on containing education exemptions and the pre-licensing course and written examinations, thank you for putting that in, it's very important. I mean, the whole initiative of this legislation is about the continuing education um, aspect of it, as well as cleaning up the legislation. I guess whoever wrote the, the, the first you know, uh, GAR on there, um, it almost looks like it was done quickly, you know, just to get it placed in, but now it's much simpler now to read. Um, and if you do the comparison, you'll see the difference between what is current and what the proposed legislation offers in cleaning up that section in GAR. Um, the one question too I had, and nobody's here from um, the insurance commissioner, is to talk about uh, the repeated course on the five years and maybe Madam Chair, you can explain, um, it's in section 217. Uh, repeated course five year uh, was not in included in the original, but you've included it in this proposed legislation on section 217. And this five year, uh, including that, can you explain uh, why that was included? Uh, I could probably get back to you if I, uh, I'll probably pose that question to Alice. Um, but I, I did hear that there was some issue with, um, I guess, restrictions altogether from having to repeat a course. Yeah. Um, in, in my thinking, you know, in taking um, continuing education credits. Right, I, I see. Think five years might be uh, a good enough time. So that way, you know, perhaps there might be changes to the course right. after five years. Um, right. Yeah, so I think it, in some ways, I think there's a balance. It keeps things stringent, um, but also flex in, in a way flexible rather than you know completely prohibiting uh, repeating a course. Um, right. But I can definitely bring that question up to to uh, yeah, and, 
and uh, that that was uh, changed in the uh, from the current you know um, added in. So I think it would would need some explanation. But I think it's a good idea. Um, most especially, I appreciated Madam Chair including the ethics courses, which is not in the original GAR requirement, um, and that your legislation includes the. Um, that they must uh, receive their ethics courses um, as well as all the other continuing education classes. So that was a good inclusion, very good inclusion. The only thing, Madam Chair, I think uh, is to find the, uh, um, and this is the penalties for any of those who violate these, um, these requirements that are proposed. And what is the, um, right now, what is the current violation um, or penalties for the, any violations? So um, thank you for that question, Senator Tadigui. So I'm looking at the, the current uh, regulations. It doesn't um, define any specific period of suspension. Um, mm -hmm. So which, what this bill does, it, it defines it as 90 day, uh, subject to 90 day suspension mm -hmm. until compliance occurs. Um, so yeah, currently in law, it states that, um, yeah, a suspension can happen. It also states revocation of all licenses, mm -hmm. um, but I think we can also clean up the language because I believe that was meant for any fraud or false certificates being provided. Um, right, right. That could be clarified a little bit more. Yeah, I think that um, I think that would be very helpful, Madam Chair, for any amendments to be made uh, to this legislation is just to clean that area up to to ensure that. Um, Okay, I'm reading it here. Uh, regulations and other law applicable to all other remedies available to the commissioner for false or fraudulent certificates or any misrepresentation. But I, I still don't see the 90, 90 day suspension. But uh, yeah, I think it, it, we can clarify that in, in this legislation. So other than that, Madam Chair, it was a, a, a much cleaner legislation or uh, proposed for GAR than it is currently now uh, and appreciate all the hard work again that uh, you and your staff has provided with this. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Senator Tadigui. Uh, Senator Frank, Frank Bloss, uh, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Madam Chair, for uh, purposes of disclosure, I am an insurance agent as well as an insurance uh, broker. Um, and uh, while I, there's, there seem, I do not perceive any conflict in being able to work on this because, you know, um, while I have to agree that uh, there may be some, uh, an, op an opportunity here to be able to, to, to clean up our, our, our insurance, um, our, our laws with regard, with respect to, to uh, the insurance brokers and agents. There, there are some, um, some questions I have with regard to, to the proposed legislation. Uh, I have to agree with uh, Senator Rada that uh, a little disappointed that uh, at least the insurance commissioner or, um, you know, another representative uh, or, or, or the director were not able to uh, uh, join us here in this public hearing so that we can go and I can ask some questions. I think I have, because of um, my profession, other than outside of, inside of politics, um, you know, and I do understand uh, there were, this, this has been a discussion for a couple, number of years. Uh, and, and one of the reasons why I guess it has, for lack of a better term, not taken, taken off is because um, there are two schools of thought here and, two, and with regard to concerns as to how this is going to be implemented and how it's going to be enforced. You know, uh, case in point here, Madam, Madam Chair, um, you know, when you're looking at the educational requirements and you're looking at the requirements for, 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 for agents, um, it appears to be specific for, for, you know, for agents, for individuals who just sell one line of insurance. But in the case of the individuals who sell multiple lines of insurance other than property, casualty, and life, um, you know, and other, you know, with, with other areas, the, the law is a little ambiguous if you will if it's if uh you're gonna have to um uh you know complete 14 credit hours times the number of different licenses you got per year okay because as it reads here it basically says that you need to have the the uh, 14 credit uh hours um basically per per, per line lines of insurance 
Now, in, in the case of an individual who basically sells five lines of insurance, 14 times five, it takes an inordinate amount of time to be able to, 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 do, to complete this. Secondly, when you look at the exemptions, and you know, the exemptions here, you basically, for continuing education exemption, you, you use the word any insurance producer who is 65 years of age. Now, on Guam law, basically, the way they stand, so agents and producers are two different classes of people. So if you say the exemption is just for the producers, that basically means then that the brokers and agents have to continue with. And it was, is that uh, basically the intent? So there are a lot of questions. I, again, I, I, you know, I agree that, uh, that uh, you know, so that, you know, agents continue to stay on top of, of not just the product, but of the, of the laws that they, they have some requirement. I will tell you, that uh, in almost every line of class, line of insurance that, I, that, that uh, you know, my company does represent, we are required annually not only to take an anti-money laundering course, but also an ethics course. Now, that's a continuing thing. You know, that we, we go back to also, uh, you know, when you, when you say you can't repeat insurance courses, there are only so many courses that you can take within the insurance industry. Okay, what's going to happen after that? And then more importantly is who's going to teach it? You know, one, one of the things here, you said 30, 30 hours uh, pre-licensing course. Who teaches it? Okay, um, that's another concern. All right. Um, you know, at one point in time, we had relied on the uh, extension uh, learning from the University of Guam, but they no longer do that. Okay, so, so there are, again, some questions that... Uh, that uh, need to be asked and answered and, and may, maybe some, some changes, some gradual changes to the law, uh, the existing law, um, you know, with regard to, to uh, educational requirements for, for, for insurance agents. But I appreciate that we're having this discussion, now. okay? Um, and um, hopefully, as uh, was, was stated earlier by, by, by Senator Rada, that uh, we can extend this hearing um, you know, to another day so that we give the opportunity for the insurance commissioner or the director of revenue and taxation to, talk, to come in uh, to discuss the, uh, the, the provisions of the bill and how it's going to be enforced and how it's going to be laid out. Okay, so thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Bots, for your expertise. Uh, I just want to do make one clarification. So it is 14 hours um, for a year annual, uh, uh, is required annually. And so the way it works is that there's six credit hours uh, per class of insurance for life, health, property, casualty. And then if there's a multiple license, so the, the bill does address multiple licensure. And so for the other six, it could be the next line of insurance, which is, um, if I could look down here, um, the other lines of insurance are, are encapsulated in those six, hour, uh, six hours. So it's six hours for the, that group and then another six hours for the other sets of lines of insurance and then two hours of ethics training. So it's a minimum uh, requirement of 14 hours. And I understand, I understand, Madam Chair, but you know, Madam Chair, you know, when, you, when you're talking about classes of insurance and lines of insurance, there's a big difference between what is expected in life insurance as opposed to what's expected for marine insurance, mm -hmm. okay? And so when you when when you have this, you know, again the the ambiguity in this whole thing, and whether or not uh, an individual who just who, why does an individual who got marine insurance have to take life insurance, or why does an individual who take his life insurance have to have to um, take a course on property and casualty? So so again, it's the ambiguity in this thing, uh, and and possibly you know the necessity of being able to have to take more than fourteen hours per year. Okay. So yeah, okay. I appreciate that. We can definitely clean up the language uh, to make yeah. it more clear. Thank you, uh, Manager. Yeah, you uh, and thank you for the the in, uh, the amendments, potential amendments, and uh, we'll definitely bring this to um, Alice also in regards to your concerns. And and just to clarify, the thirty credit hours is pre licensure, not uh, the renewal of the license itself. And according to the bill, it is from a qualified instructor, and so. One of the things this bill does, it, it allows for online learning. And I think that's where DRT is moving towards, more towards is online um, you know, workshops. And, and uh, so it's, it can open up the, the offerings perhaps of, of uh, qualified instructors. So that's one way in which um, this can be achieved, but definitely would like to um, 
you know, have your questions being posed to uh, the um, Department of Revenue and Taxation. And uh, I forgot to mention she is sick. So she was, um, she was scheduled to come, come in and, and present, but unfortunately she, uh, she was sick and could not be here today. Um, but would we'll definitely uh, resolve any concerns or questions uh, that um, my colleagues have. Okay, thank you, Manager. Thank you, Senator Bloss. Um, so being that there are no further testimonies or questions, um, the hearing for Bill 224-36 is duly heard. Um, and now we are going to adjourn um, this public hearing. It is now 11.50 a.m. Uh, thank you, everyone. Have a great day. This is awesome.